have Adam call us. Do it now, call me. Call me now, Adam. <coughs> Do it. Where's the call, Adam? Where's the call? Oh yeah, he's probably not even watching the stream. Okay, that's that's a nice fail. So let's let's call him now. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? How are you? How are you? I I just uh, <laughs> I just went live on stream and and I uh, was trying to talk to, was trying to talk to you through the stream. I, I said that call me Adam now. Do it now, and, and then I just remembered that maybe you're not even watching the stream, so... Yeah. It's, a, it's a pretty common mistake. I've often, uh, when I do like group sessions, I'll sometimes say, Hey, uh, message me if you can't hear me, and I'm like, oh wait. <laughs> that doesn't work, does it? So, yeah, now it's easy. Alright, so, uh, are we all set up? Everything's good to go? Yeah, yeah. So you have control here, so... Uh, what are the things you can do and what do I have to do myself? Um, just what games do you want to do? I mean, do you have a selection of games or hands you want to cover? It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting, kind of interesting right now because uh, I did hit a 90 by in downswing in 30s, so I, I moved to 15s, and I, I'm kind of interested if if people would want to see my games from 30s or the most recent games from 15s. Um, My games from 30s are more interesting, but yeah, yeah. if there's a you know, strong preference from the audience, then whatever they want to see is fine by me. Yeah, I think 30s, 30s are interesting because it's it's I will probably have played a bit worse considering I was close to moving right. down in stakes. So it, it's kind of inter yeah. interesting to see my how my thought That's process uh, gets worse when I'm on a big downswing. So, uh, yeah, let's do it. Alright, okay. so we just need to filter for 30s. Uh, let's just do game details, turn on volumes. I never remember how rake is done, so I always give myself margin of error. And that'll make sure it gets them, and then what this fun. Um, I tend to sort games by date, so uh, this is the easiest way. And then uh, we can just pick the uh, most recent, like the last day you're playing. Yeah, it's and it has all the tournaments. We'll just maybe try to pick one that's longer. Uh, sounds good. Twenty-two minutes. Probably get heads up. And get the order right. We play all hands, and we are good to go. Um, how big can I make this? Maybe just maximize it so everyone. Can yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna check on stream. One second. Yeah, I don't know. Can you see here? I I'm gonna do it myself, and it's a bit better. Cool. But I mean, it, I, okay, yeah. Just be careful not to to do the infinite mirrors too much. <clears throat> it can sometimes cause memory leaks. I know on Skype, if, if I have a, if I like someone's watching a Skype screen share of a team viewer screen share, it can uh, create issues. But, uh, careful. But, uh, I have right, cool. I, I have no idea what you said. Did you say infinite oh. mirrors? Mirrors. So infinite like when you mirrors. Take two mirrors and you put them next to each other and they keep reflecting them. Uh, each other, you can cause memory issues. Anyways, okay. it's, it was starting to happen where like there was like a picture of a picture of a picture of a picture of a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's just let's do that. <laughs> uh, let's not talk physics anymore. All right. So yeah, this should be in your opening range, um, either opening or limping range. It's uh, <clears throat> the population tends to play pretty poorly versus both opens and limps. They tend to overfold to every opening size. They tend to under ISO versus limbs, and so it makes a lot of hands that maybe would have been cl would be close in GTO play just like really profitable opens. Okay, my my my, ra my ranges stuff. right now are from your uh, beating spin angle video pack, and uh, then I think you were playing a little bit tighter from the small line. I mean, I don't remember you opening four six off there or even limping it, but maybe yeah. you have just advanced your game. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a close hand anyways. I'm pretty sure I've 
probably was playing 6 12. But uh, it's definitely at the bottom of our range. So, I mean, either way, it's not going to be a big deal. But I think that's definitely worth putting into a play. And um, I, I just decided to limp here. But I usually just mean race, but I'm just. I, I know in in your video pack you mentioned that you should be mean racing a lot more than limping. Uh, in I like limping with hands. Um, when I limp deep, this is one of the hands I like to limp. Um, and it's just because it limp flax really well. Um, you know, you sort of have good value versus ISO ranges a lot more than you would have versus like three bet ranges. Um, and then on top of that, you're also very playable in three white pots. When you limp, you're going to be playing a lot more three white pots than if you min race. So, uh, so this hand sort of does well in that sense. Uh, it kind of avoids people three betting. People don't ISO shove very much deep, but they do three bet shove a lot. Uh, but EVs run really close between min raising and limping. Um, it'll sometimes just come down to subtle factors like reads you have on players. Um, you know, if there's a strong player, strong tight player in the small blind, a uh, loose weak player in the big blind, you probably want to min raise to kind of isolate them. If you have a, a strong player in the big blind and a weak player in the small blind, maybe you want to limp to have sort of have them tag along so that you don't have to play against a strong player heads up as often. So there's a lot of room to kind of, or based on the specific stack situation, reads again, you can deviate a lot based on the situation uh, between limping and min raising on the button. So it's absolutely fine. Um, we go ahead and value bet. Pretty standard. Size is fine. Uh, but one question though, you uh, you have mentioned about the uh, value of like, getting your two X's end faster, so you should be, you know, it's if I mean race, then the game's gonna end faster. So if the EVs are really close, then I should probably choose the faster route. Maybe. I mean, in the end, that's probably true for maximizing EV hourly. But I mean. Even in, in low multipliers, win rate maxing isn't like necessarily bad. Um, it lowers your variance for one thing, uh, which can be really helpful, especially in such a high variance format. Yep, since um, I did move, it, it move down because of variance. EV, so. With sort of equity realization, with sort of EV realization almost, it tends to make you run sort of closer to EV sometimes, um, just because it lowers a little bit those uh, variances. But uh, but yeah, so, so there's room to win at max even in low multipliers. It's not going to be a big deal. I mean, it's not something to be too paranoid about. I mean, in some sense, like, those kind of little differences in your EV hourly are going to be much, you know, not, not nearly as important as strategy differences, mental game differences. There's so much other stuff you can think about um, that, you know, how long things take. I mean, uh, until you're, you know, routinely four table like hundreds or something. Oh, wait, 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 wait one that's second. Right, Adam, necessary. wait for one second. Someone mentioned mm -hmm. about uh, my mic being a bit too loud and yours is a little bit, uh, a bit, of, a little bit less. So maybe I just uh, turn my mic down a little bit. So maybe you can, okay. guys, so can better? tell me if it's better or not. Let's see yeah. what let's see what they say in the chat. So we'll go on. Yeah, you can you can continue. Yeah. So, so anyways, yeah, that, that's sort of um, something to think about. Uh, all right. So let's just just go on the hand. So we see that uh, super standard. Um, yeah, I think we can probably get away with barreling here. It is on the thin side, so it is strongly worth checking. You know, considering checking back. But because we have the draw, we end up having a very strong top pair of hands. Um, it's sort of like top pair. Yeah, I had the blocker to the check 10 as well. I, I was a bit worried basically because it's check 10 yeah, and some two pair making it there after getting two colors. So I yeah, just... it's definitely kind of a thin spot. We definitely don't want to bet big here. You know, you don't want to get scared and be like, oh, I want to protect. I mean, you definitely want to bet smaller here because villains have a lot of traps, um, have strong ranges. But I think we can still get one more street. Um, it's going to be pretty rare for recreationals to fold a pair of queens here. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to get the value from Queens on the river. Yeah, but generally it's better just to get it now because there's a lot of rivers where you won't be able to value that. Um, again, it's a pretty sort of dry board. There's a lot of bad rivers for us, right? Like a 7, 8, 9, 10, Jack, Queen, Ace. Like they're all kind of bad for us. Maybe the Ace isn't so bad, but uh, uh, I guess the 10 isn't bad because we had a straight. But, um, you know, there's not really a lot of great rivers for value betting. So, 
Uh, I think we just get value now. We still get queens now. Um, we get draws to call. There's pair plus draws. People in general play fairly passively. As long as we don't bet super big, we're going to be fine there. Um, and we can still value bet when the 10 comes, so we can still free barrel sometimes. And as played, yeah, I guess we just go ahead and bluff catch there. It's a small bet. Small bet's going to be pretty weak. Cool. Um, you can defend here. Oh, wait, wait, can you go back to that last one, when he just bet so small on the river there? I, I've just noticed that so many fishy players also bet smaller with their strong hands as well, like two pair plus hands. Some guys just min bet and do weird things, so... Or... Yeah, I mean, the, their range in general tends to be on the weaker side. Their value tends to be weaker when they bet smaller. Um, if they really under bet, then yes, it will have nuts in it. Um, I mean, recreationals do trap sometimes, so... Yeah, I sort of think of it as like a polar range here with, you know, thin value. It's sort of polar between thin value and nuts. There's not a lot of bluffs. People very rarely under bet bluffs. It's worth noting. It's a very, very common tendency. Um, you know, it's, it's even amongst, you know, quite high level regs to uh, under bet ranges that tend to not have enough bluffs in them. Um, and sometimes are value, you know, value heavy in some other ways too sometimes. So... Yeah, definitely when you get this small bet, you don't really think he's bluffing, but he will have thin value here. Um, and it'll be some combination of thin value and nuts. Um, for recreationals, it tends to be more weighted towards thin value. For um, regs, it can sometimes be more weighted towards nuts. So I should actually probably be raising here like to 100 or something like that? Because well, no, it's... because, I mean, what are we getting value from when you raise? When you're raising, you don't want to think about the starting range. You want to think about his calling range. So if you raise here, I mean, it would make sense maybe to raise if you expect him to always call with queens. Um, but essentially, he's never folding his traps, any of his two pair or straights that's, you know, trapping you. And he will fold his queens pretty often. It's a pretty scary board to bet call a queen. I mean, if he's sort of block betting it, there's a good chance he folds it at least sometimes. So it's going to be pretty hard to get value here. Okay, I just from my experience, they when they bet small, then they usually call a small raise as well, because they level themselves into thinking that they induced the raise there or, or something like that, especially yeah, since... I mean, it's, it's, stakes too. I mean, I'm uh, most, I, I review probably more high, you know, high stakes and 60s, 100s, where probably the recreationals fold a little more in those places. Um, so maybe I'm giving, you know, your population a little too much credit. That's fair. Yeah, I mean, if you think he's going to almost always call with queens, then yeah, sure, go ahead and raise. You can raise fold small. I mean, I still expect him to have some weaker king x still as well with that sizing. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, just bet, bet the turn. <laughs> yeah, okay, um, okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's see, there's only value raise here, yeah, okay. So, but if we bet the turn, we're obviously not calling a shot there, I assume. No, no, we'd be bet folding the yeah. turn. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So yeah, you should defend here, probably. Uh, unless you have reads that they're particularly strong or something. But the thing is that this hand is just really live versus min-raising ranges. Um, your pairs are live, your straight draws are live. People tend to open high, high card hands, and you have a low card hand. And so in some sense, because you get such good pot odds, um, it's, it's often, you know, this hand just ends up being a call. It's sort of good enough uh, because it's live. So yeah, I'm, I, I'm usually, I think I'm defending it. It's it's also from the video pack, I remember you saying as well that you can, from bottom min raises, even though the ranges are tighter yeah. than bottom min raises in heads up, but with the small blinds dead money in there, you can just still defend pretty much as wide as you defend in heads up. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I found that, that likely we, we probably want to defend maybe even a little wider with sort of low card, live card, suited cards. Um, are about the same, but sometimes a little tighter with sort of high card junk. So like in heads up, we can defend like queen two off. Whereas here, it's much more difficult to defend those high cards. Um, even like king two off, king three off, king four off. There's a lot of those kind of high card danglers where you could be much happier folding because um, they're just dominated more often and they have less equity. Um, they, they sort of are the hands, because when you have drawing hands, they sort of have the same amount of equity versus strong ranges as weak ranges, or very similar. But when you have more of those, like, showdown, you know, high card danglers, um, they will fluctuate a lot based on whether they actually have a high card um, or, you know, and how much they're dominated um, versus how much they're playing against low cards. 
So, uh, so yeah, these places where you can sort of fend sort of extra wide with some of these low carb junk. Is where you can sort of fend sort of extra wide with some of these low carb junk. But you're gonna want to be more careful with some of the high carb queen deuce off, uh, king deuce off kind of stuff. Okay. Stuff that's not connected, no no flush draw potentials, etc. All right. Uh, so yeah, there's some room to limp that, but it's right, right on the border. Uh, yeah, that's a fold. Come on, X N. Uh, there's some room to three bet here, but opening range is tend to be so strong, and people don't play great posts, so flat is fine too. But you could three bet call here. Um, and yeah, we probably just check folds. It's to be fair, this is a kind of bad board for the button player, right? He doesn't really hit this board nearly as hard as we do. So there is room to play back here if you suspect people will be see betting, you know, really wide, lots of bluffs. Um, there's room to flat, there's room to check raise here. Uh, we do have two, two strong overs, so you have to be a little bit careful. But I think read plus it's probably okay just to fold here. Um, recreational players tend to be pretty value heavy in a lot of places. So you can kind of fold and wait for wait to get more reads, but this is fine. This is going to be a fine hand to defend. Uh, uh, is fine. this uh, is this a hand history? It's the latest thirties uh, I played, so it's last day. Yeah. You just okay. So, so that's when I. <laughs> that's actually uh, when I thirties. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wait, here's the story. Uh, I, I was streaming and and, and I have like seven buy-ins left in my roll for 30s and then I got a uh, host from CoreDB I had like 180 viewers on stream and in front of all the viewers I busted my seven buy-ins there so this, this is the session from that yep yep so hopefully we get some more interesting stuff um yep this yeah it's, it's kind of close here but it's a fold shoving rage is really strong and button still has a strong range too. Yeah, this is fine. Defend, yeah. Um, I prefer check raising here. Really? It's one of these parts where, yeah, because he's going to be betting really wide and not really want to fold the check raises very much with like high cards. So you still get floats. It's also not the kind of texture that people barrel on very much. Um, a lot of times you're trying to side with the nuts between check raising and check calling. You want to think a lot about the next street tendencies. How much is your opponent going to barrel? Um, the more he barrels, the better it is to slow play. The less he barrels, the better it is just to check raise and get value while you sort of can, while his range is wide. I mean, um, there's jacks, queens, kings on the on the turn that are good barrel cards. So I, I expected expected uh, him to barrel those cards. Or yeah, they're also good bluff cards for you know after you check raise, you can um, check the turn. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of room where you just get wide defending ranges here anyways, and you build a pot, and you can always induce bluffs on the turn by checking. So, I mean, how much more is your opponent going to barrel after, you know, betting? How much are they actually going to fold to check raises? Um, and if you think they're folding a lot, we probably should be bluffing. I mean, we probably should be bluffing here anyways, but uh, it's worth noting that, I mean, we have a bluffing range here most likely. Um, there's just a lot of those kind of ace high, king high, um, you know, if your opponent's c-betting a wide range, um, if you have reads that they c-bet most of their range, then they'll have a lot of hands that can defend here that don't bear all the turn, and that we have a lot of trouble getting value from on later streets. Um, you know, when he has king high, he's not going to barrel the ace high on the turn. Um, probably same with queen high. Um, so, and of course, when those cards hit, you were going to get paid anyways, um, regardless of whether you check raise or check call. So it's, uh, it's one of these places where I think a lot of... Um, players tend to over-check call with value um, without having a really good reason because there's so many people who do not barrel, who barrel way too little, and, it's, and so many textures where people just do not barrel enough to make, um, you know, slow playing correct. And a lot of those same places, you know, because people don't check-raise a lot of trips here, once you check-raise, a lot of players will, you know, want to float wider, will want to defend because... You know, they say, well, you know, he's probably check calling a trip. Um, so you sort of get a little bit of extra metagame edge from this, too. Um, it's, I mean, obviously, it's a close spot. Like, in GTO play, we would be doing both, most likely. 
Um, it's going to be both a check raise and a check call. We have to have some trips in our check raising range, otherwise we have no nuts there. We have to have wait for there. wait for one second there. I think that's yep. uh, P Box just hosted us with 16 viewers, so thank you very much, P Box. Okay, uh, let's go. Uh, it's it's also because uh, do you want to check raise also because you don't want him to I don't know bot control the turn with a 10, but he, we just get more value from a 10. Not giving him again. I mean, if you expect him to bluff a lot on later streets, then yeah, of course we check call. Um, you know, and if we expect him to check fold a lot of his overcards but barrel them on the turn, yeah, of course we check call. Um, but you know, you really want to ask yourself. I mean, how much is your opponent going to actually fold those overcards to a check raise, anyways? Right, the ones that could hit the turn, ones that you're trying to you know let hit the turn, let catch up. How much are they going to fold them on the flop, anyways, to a check raise? Um, and then conversely, how much are they really going to barrel bluffs on a paired board? Um, and so here's the king that you said that he'd be barreling really wide, right? <laughs> There's the perfect barrel card. We expect Maybe he has a 10. Point. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe. So then he, he said we lost value. Um, so, you know, saying that he's going to barrel every king or ace, I mean, this is just not true. It doesn't match up with population tendencies. People yeah. really don't barrel very much on turn. But also in the population tendencies, you also mentioned that people tend to check race. Uh, value heavy ranges so mm -hmm. so maybe that maybe my check race is gonna look strong as hell there <laughs> if we're talking if we're talking about population tendencies but now you're sort of overthinking it because you know if, if we really think that our opponent's capable of folding then you know then that's a problem but i mean how many recreational players are going to be folding again very wide or thinking about you know what our raising range looks like it's a board where there's a lot of pure air if we're check raising a bluff it's, it's really airy there's a lot of room for him to level himself and think that we're playing back on a dry board. There's lots of players who check raise a lot of bluffs on paired boards um, because it can be really, really good if you don't defend wide enough. So there is incentive for our opponent to still defend to check raises, and um, you know, and the wider he see bets, the more hands he has to defend with. Um, a lot of people see bet really wide on these boards. Every last ten, every ace high, every king high, every bluff. Um, it's it's a really good spot to consider it, um, despite being really dead. Okay. And it's definitely part of a balanced play. I mean, if you're really worried about being balanced versus a very strong opponent, it is going to be sometimes check raised as well. Um, but that's generally not that important. Uh, and then he checks back. <laughs> Great. That, this is an awesome run out. Um, I guess it's not so bad. We get some, We still get value from ace high. Um, about it. I guess you could bluff catch with queen high, jack high. I think a 10 should be checking behind there on the turn as well, that quite often, or you don't think so? Um, what were you saying? Sorry. Uh, if he happens to have a hand like 10 9, then I don't see much of a reason for him to bet the turn because he doesn't have a kicker. He's just yeah. dropping with other 10 Xs, so. Yep. So, yeah, I, th I think this is a clear lead on the river. He's got 10s, he's got ace high, he's got queen high. He's got called one. Oh, too bad that we didn't stack him. Um, yeah, everything else is fine. Yeah, I mean, I guess someone was asking if we could leave the turn, but yeah, no. I, I mean, we do don't like it either. It's, this is just sort of the, the unfortunate side, like the turns where we expect him to bluff more, he's also checking back more value, right? Um, like on lower card turns, you won't bluff, but it'll, it'll bet some value. So it's also hard to like get, you know, it's easy to think, oh, you know, he's going to barrel, we want him to catch up, but it's hard to sort of have both happen at the same time. So I mean, if you, if, you lead, if you lead the turn there, I think the king is actually a really scary card for a 10 because people will call plenty of king highs on this sort of flop. I agree. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's really not much. I mean, that's the problem too. Like over cards are kind of good for our check call range too. So there's not, I mean... Really, our opponent probably shouldn't be barreling that many over her cards, and on top of that, probably won't barrel a lot of pairs. So uh, that's that's sort of the idea. There's a lot of spots where you're just not going to get paid. Uh, shove's good. Pretty standard. Um, that's shallow. So here we're we're getting shallow. You could start thinking about limping stuff like this to keep the SPR deeper, but I think 18 BBs we can still win there. Yeah, this was just based on the population tendencies that you mentioned. Yeah. That people tend to just fold too much to min raises, so you should just rather min raise more than limp. Absolutely. The one thing you just have to be careful about is um, is really worrying about SPR. Um, you with suited connected hands, hands that have really high levels of playability. 
you want to kind of try to squeeze out as much of that playability edge out of those hands as possible, sort of what makes them unique. So you want to kind of maximize their potential um, for using that drawing ability. And when you get shallow, um, limping starts being better because it keeps stacks deeper post, which keeps more room to get implied odds, essentially. It makes your draws stronger post flop. Um, <clears throat> so once you do start getting shallower in stacks, you know, around six, you know, a little shallower than this, 16, 15 BBs, you really should be limping the, the most playable um, semi-bluffs uh, because you want to keep SPR deeper. So in general, you'll want to be mid-raising fewer and fewer suited hands, and uh, especially, and fewer like connected, like full connectors. Uh, less playability as you get shallower. But, but that will still be it's fine. Um, and, and this is fine to bluff. Again, it's not super playable. People do overfold. It's also fine to limp it. It's going to be. Oh yeah, maybe maybe we should switch to the heads up hard. Maybe I have some stats on him if if sure. I can yeah, see no how tight no. he is pre flop. Oh look, it's coffee hard. Yeah. <laughs> Subtle advertisement there. Yeah. But looks like we don't have any stats. I don't know. Maybe we're faster by arranging those things. You can just take control yeah. and. By the way, in case I, I sometimes get like students who have been using PT4 for years and they don't know this, you can hold down Control and then click and drag groups around. You don't actually need to go into the thing and go lock, unlock. Um, you can just, you know, even at the table while playing, you can quickly click and drag a box um, just by holding down Control. Replay that hand slightly slower. Okay. Or was that sarcastic? So maybe. <laughs> I'm so used to going so slow through histories that uh, with Pbox we, we, we took an hour and a half to do I think one game. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Alright. Um, so yeah, uh, what happened here? We Oh we checked back pre, which is fine. We <laughs> This is a, worth defending on the flop. If you were thinking about check folding, you probably should be thinking about check raising. Oh, um, okay. Bots are just awesome places to check for Yeah, I just, I just recently, recently, oh, yep, yep. I recently oh. just remembered that, or just, I think I also heard you just say, say it in, a, in a, one of your, one of your video packs, and then I just recently just took up uh, by check, uh, check raising more often in those limp pots. Yeah. And, and it, it's the backdoor flush draw. I mean, it's just um, recognizing these backdoor flush draws and incorporating them into your game, and it's. So important in limp pots. It's one of the places where people play absolutely the worst. Even you know, pretty high level regs have just massive um, leaks, technical leaks in limp pots because they don't recognize backdoor flush draws, and, and as a result, and, and tend to over over play overly tight to limp events. Um, the idea is that in limp pots, ranges are weaker in general, and so you kind of need to lower your standard for play. It's like, well, I've got something. I've got a backdoor flush draw. That's good enough in the limp pot because everyone has even less, even more nothing than they usually do. You know, people always have that cliche about heads up poker. You know, you know, chances are everyone flopped nothing, so it's just whoever gets to it first. You know, stupid stuff like that. But in limp pots, it's sort of even more true that you know both of us don't hit boards, and so if you're overfolding, you make his like air that misses just really, you know, way too profitable. On the other hand, if you're not overfolding, you can make his air that's always missing and it's constantly trying to see that really unprofitable. And so it's um, it's a really easy way to, to increase your edge in one pots. It's just recognize nice backdoor flush draws, some of these check raise opportunities. Um, as play, we leave the turn. I think this is a this is a fun hand. Let's let's see the river. I want to see if it's a little bigger on the turn. Um, just to try to fold out more fives and like random ace highs, put more pressure on ten high, jack high. I think I would maybe make it 45. It's not even a bad spot to pot it. Oh, don't so. worry. You'll get pressure. You'll get pressure on the river. And then you overbet slightly. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a fine spot to be betting pretty big. Like, his range should be pretty capped. Weighted towards weak queens, but they never hold. There's a nines. Some random jack high, ten high. Um, I don't think we need to go quite this big to get the same number of folds. Like, some, like, 105. And in fact, I've had some um, evidence when I've looked at different sizes that this is one of the optimal value betting sizes because you get the most calls per amount of money you put in the pot. 
the over betting. It, it turns out, for whatever reason, it's one of those like best bang for your buck value sizes. Oh, wow, um, great. So I, I did like, exactly the opposite and just bet as much as I should have bet if I wanted to get a call. Well, I mean, so, should have bet if I wanted to get a call. Well, I mean, so, I mean, you, you obviously get fewer calls, you know, betting this size than maybe half pot. But it's not that many fewer, and you get paid a lot more. Um, but of course, when you're bluffing, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, when I looked at those optimal sizes, generally a little bit less than half pot is a very good bluff size in a lot of places, especially when, when ranges are really weak. Um, and then a little bit more than half pot tends to be a really good bluff size. Um, kind of hits those critical frequencies for whatever reason with population tendencies. So did, did you say um, 105? You would have bet 105 or something like that? Yeah, there's a bluff here, yeah. I yeah, think okay. that would be my favorite size. So about 100, yeah, 100 plus a little bit. Um, sort of the, the biggest size, the smallest size over half pot that has three digits. <laughs> But, but by the way, if you if you check raise the flop, do, do you do it against complete randoms as well? Let's say it def yes. in a sp okay, it doesn't matter if you have reads or anything. So, and and both both the population of regs and recreationals over folds to check raises. Interestingly, recreationals see bet a lot less often, but they also overfold. Um, I think it's because their ranges are just so weak when they limp. They they also limp. They limp a lot of junky hands. Um, and they tend to play pretty fitful. They don't float wide with ace highs or gut shots. And that's a lot of what hits and lend pots. So, yeah, I found that um, both population tendencies overfold to check raises. Uh, but you so, did suggest betting 75% on the turn. I think I, I had like two-thirds spot there on the turn, but you said you, I should go bigger there. Yeah, a little bit. But it's not that big a deal. But it's it's better to make it like seventy five percent. Yeah, or something. I don't think it really makes too much of a difference in here. Because I have a bet like I have a bet over. bet slider op option that I bet two thirds pot basically always in these situations. I mean, yeah, I don't right? want I don't want to say that always, but but yeah, it's on my bet slider. Yeah, but, I'd probably recommend changing that to seventy five percent. Okay, yeah. It's it's a more often good size. On. Turn sizes tend to be pretty big, and I think it's generally um, like a bigger mistake to aim. To, to use a standard size that's too low than, you know, too big. Because there's so many places where GTO calls for really big sizes and not that many places where it calls for even half pot in turn situations. Um, and less than half pot is very rare, unless you're like, you know, out of position, block bet, dogging, you know, that sometimes happens. There's some weird block betting that happens. But if you're, you know, betting a normal polar range, 75% or 70% of the pot around there is, is, is generally a good standard. Um, especially if you're used to using half pot, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a strict upgrade versus basically everyone. Um, if you're using a standard size, um, it's better to use that. Um, obviously, there's room to you know, try to adjust the situation and to your player and you know, versus weak players, try to pick different sizes with different hands based on the situation. But uh, but in general, if you're looking for a standard size, good baseline, around 75% of the pots are really good overall turn size for a lot of uh, situations. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, and on the river, I recommend a little smaller. And, uh, hey, you still bluff comedy. And he, he snapped uh, cold there as well, I, I think it was. It. Yeah, it's the optimal value size. <laughs> That's why you use a king here. That's why you overbet like, with, like, king 10 or king jack here. Uh, and you can get away with overbetting that size because, yeah, it'll just snap off. Um, I mean, his calling range is going to be almost identical to betting 105. Um, he probably still calls queen X, to be fair, but the goal is you're folding out like jack high, like play 10 highs, lower pairs, random ace highs. Um, so here we, we min-raise folded? No, I think he didn't. Oh, he three bet, okay. Yeah, we min-raise folded. Um, yeah, I think it's probably a good practice just to limp the bottom of your range rather than min-raising it, even in cases where people overfold a little. Um, the idea being is that you sort of limit a little bit how much value you give to your opponent that way um, by sort of limiting how much money you put in. Um, by taking the worst hands in your range and using the action that you know, puts in the least amount of money, you're sort of manipulating a little bit better like how you're building pots. And so it's generally a little bit better to take bluffs that are a little stronger than complete junk, especially deep stacked, where people call a lot. Um, the basic idea is that in, in these kind of deep stack situations, you're going to get called, you know, probably more than half the time. And so every time you mid-raise, you're going to see a pot that's about four, that's four big blinds, 
more than half the time. And so on average, we sort of see a pot that's more than two big blinds deep. Whereas when we limb, we're going to see a pot of two big blinds less than all of the time. You know, only when they check back, because otherwise we fold. So let's say they ISO 30% of the time. We'll see 70% of the time a pot of two big blinds. And so we think about the average size, it's like 1.4. And so you see bigger pots when you min-raise. And that gives you a lot of incentive to just use more playable ranges, um, have a little bit more equity and value to your hands when you min-raise versus when you limp. Uh, both are really profitable bluffs. Uh, both work well. Uh, but it also works better with post-flop tendencies where, again, people massively overfold the limp pots, but they don't overfold that much in min-raise pots, especially not, not, not anymore. Um, it used to be a bigger deal three or four years ago, but even the, the uh, recreational players don't overfold that much to see that. So, uh, uh, let's pumps. let's go back a little bit. Uh, you said if they if they if they ISO like thirty percent, then you can still limp in all the chunky hands. But oh, le yeah. let's say when they raise like forty percent, you can still limp all the chunky hands unless they're very good post. Oh, um, okay. Uh, you're, you're really looking at, if, if your opponent, you know, plays poorly post, overfolds, has, you know, you know serious leaks, um, generally they'll have to ISO around 50% of the time to make you unable to, to make you about indifferent with like seven deuce off, to make you start open folding. You're still not, you're still able to limp fold. Um, once you're ISOing like 60% of the time, it's, you generally can't really limp fold. Um, you can limp fold some of the very best limp folds and they'll be about, um, indifferent to open folding, um, and so you'll limp fold very rarely, and then anywhere past 60, you, you just will only limp, you know, call in some way. So, uh, so, so that's the idea. What? Just, so even against someone who's isoing like 50%, you can still limp in those chunky hands? Did you say that? 50%? Yeah, you, you said that, that when they uh, ISO like 60%, then it's too much? Yeah, yeah, 50% is when you start open folding. Um, and oh, then you okay. start, you know, we fold more and more until you get 60, where you're folding almost all of your, you know, junky stuff, the bottom of your limping range. Um, and then once you get over 60, you just don't have limp folding ranges, essentially. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, so, so limping here and then stabbing post tends to be a little bit better. Um, it's just sort of sets up pots a little bit better for you. It's a little lower variance, uh, it, and it sort of um, functions better with our post-flop game plan. Functions better with how we want to exploit people post-flop. Because you'll flop lots of air and just be able to lip see bet it as a bluff all the time. Um, whereas in min raise pots, you won't be able to see bet nearly as much, because people don't overfold on nearly as many ports. Uh, all right, again, I'm limping Jack Deuce for basically the same reason, especially with... Uh, crappy kind of hands. Um, and it's worth noting that, you know, you're saying just open fold 60 off. Um, empirically, if you're playing the hand well, it's about a quarter of a big blind better limp than open folded. That's half a small blind. That's a huge amount of edge if you multiply it by, like, you know, 10, 20% of open folding. Um, you know, you're cutting your BB per 100 by about 2 or 3 BB per 100. That's a pretty serious effect. I mean, if you talk to any cash guy, you know, what they do... To get two BB per hundred added on to their BB per hundred, I mean, they would, you know, sacrifice little children probably. So, um, you know, it's not something worth, you know, teasing about. Um, if you're not comfortable playing post, you'll get more practice by limping it, and you should be working on your game to be more comfortable post to where you can limp it, um, you know, profitably versus almost everyone. Um, so, uh, yep. Um, yeah, I think 100% BPIP readless versus, you know, for in, in any place where you're assuming edge, where you think you're better than your opponent, and you're playing against a recreational player compared to yourself, um, you should be uh, probably playing 100%. Um, unless you get reads that they're like crazy maniacs. Um, as soon as you, you get crazy maniac read, yeah, drop it down massively. But, uh, but yeah, if you're playing against some weaker... Um, I mean, it's worth noting that even versus stronger players, you're still looking to play like 95%. Um, balanced play calls for about 95% BPIP, so um, it's not really even that exploited to play 100. Um, on the button, yeah. A uh, small blind, where I'm talking about heads up, you know, third player's lost, we're playing heads up, just like heads up, sit and go, and I'm talking about small blind or button, small blind and button, to the same play. 
Um, yeah, versus a min raise, you know, in the big blind, yeah, we're full bidding stuff. <laughs> uh, what do you think about those full bot size C bets in limp bots? I know you talked about them being really strong in uh, in uh, raised bots, but what are, what are your expect- well? In some sense, all rangers are weaker in limp pots. So yes, they're not as strong as they are in mid raise pots. The value tends to be not as strong. It tends to have more bluffs. It's just because the starting range is weaker. And he plays a similar strategy. So he ends up with a weaker range. I still think it's pretty value heavy. Um, I would strongly consider folding here if it wasn't for the fact that he doesn't, like, we don't really expect him to have all that many um, actual nuts here. Uh, like, or have to have actual value hands. Because he's, he has opens. He's open shoved um, before. So, you know, he has some sort of opening strategy. Um, I mean, from what I what I, I've observed from uh, uh, from what I've observed from fifties uh, and thirties, I have noticed that those spot size bets in in limp bots, they're I think I've seen so many people just use those as standards, and they're just not necessarily strong always. I guess it depends on the board texture, but yeah, you get reads pretty quickly though. I mean, if he uses it a lot, then you'll figure out that it's standard. Um, I'm still giving this a lot of credit, and I would be folding except for the fact that we don't expect a lot of aces or queens to A, limp, and yeah. B, like, bet particularly big because it's a dry board and they feel really, you know, we don't expect him to need protection here. So here he seems a little bit full of shit, so I think we call, but you should still give these bets um, a lot of credit. Um, I'll just get quickly, I saw that someone asked about the limping 75 BBs with trash. Um, try it out. It's going to depend on your population. Um, in the population I've played, uh, it's on like Bovada, so it's pretty weak players. It, it, it ends up being really, really good. Um, you know, there's a lot of even regulars and recreationals who will ISO like 15%. I've had regulars check back Ace Jackal versus me. Um, you know, 75 BBs deep. I mean, it's awesome. You just get all these free flops and they play 100% fit full post. They just, you know, fold to, to Lipsy bet super wide. You know, they fold all the same range they would in a min-raise pot. You get that, like, 50% fold, 5% check raise, um, you know, and 15% ISO. I mean, it's just printing money versus some of these players. Um, so experiment with it. I think it works really well. It's low variance. Um, it, you know, generally, especially if you're playing 75 DDs, you're playing those turbos, win rate maxing is awesome. You want to play as many hands as you can versus the recreational because the whole point of playing turbo is you're not paying very much rake per hand. So at that point, you know, any more win rate maxing just lowers your variance more, um, increases your ROI more. Um, and so I, I think it limping, you know, even in those deep games is just really good uh, with junk. It's just so profitable. <laughs> makes your life so easy. And on top of that, what's cool is that it makes your min raising range stronger. And so when you're playing against regs, they sometimes aren't used to the fact that your min-raising range is actually quite a bit stronger than most people's, right? Like, because you'll be min-raising, you know, maybe top 50, 60, 70 percent, and they're used to people min-raising like 90 for 80, for 80, 90, 100, 80, 90 percent. So you'll also set up places where a lot of players will make mistakes versus you, not only in the limp pots, but also in min-raise pots, where maybe they'll play back too much versus your min-raises and your C-bets. So, um, all right, so here, uh, yeah, I think it's fine to call it like, uh, race fold, yeah, I really don't like, yeah, race folding here I think is one of those, um, you know, one of those plays that can s- sound okay, and there's like some justifications for it, but ends up costing a lot of EV um, in, in most situations. Uh, the problem with race folding here is that you're turning your hand into a bluff. Um, there's no way around it. Um, as soon as you start saying, oh, I'm raising for protection, well, okay, Protection can be a way to fold out some of villain's playability, share of the pot, capture factor. It's often said equity share, but I hate using equity. Um, so in any case, um, you know, the idea of protection is that you can get extra value through folding out some of their value in a sense. Um, but that only gives you extra value. You still sort of, it, it can sometimes be up to like an extra, you know, it, it sort of functions like giving you extra equity when called. That's the best way to think about it, or extra value when called. Um, and it means you don't need as much, but you still need some. And you check rings here. I mean, how many hands are calling that are worse? Like, there's a couple, like King Jack, King Ten. Um, there's a couple fives, I guess, but you'll chop with a lot of them by the end of the board. 
So your, you know, your, your equity on call is going to be really poor. And so even if you fold out some equity share, you're still just bluffing. You're turning your head into a bluff. And, um, you know, if we think that his range is strong, you know, you're not comfortable calling, then why are you comfortable value touting yourself by building an even bigger pot? So be really careful of these spots because oftentimes when we turn thin value into a bluff, that can be one of the most expensive mistakes. Those are some of the lines that cost, that have the biggest EV difference mistakes. Those are some of the lines that cost, that have the biggest EV difference. I mean, you'll often hear me say, you know, EVs are close here, EVs are close here. There are some places where EVs are not close. And this is one of these where often EVs are really far. And check raising here could be burning, you know, like a big blind, especially versus some of the population. Like it burns massive amounts of money. Um, really, it's a spot. It's check call or check fold. If you have reads to say this range is even extra strong, you can absolutely check fold. It's fine. Standard is to check call. Um, we're relatively readless here. His value doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it's fine. And uh, we could actually look to check call another bet on the turn because we have pair plus draw, which is a very strong type of hand on the turn as a bluff catcher. Uh, but we don't need to because people don't barrel. Surprise, surprise. And we just check fold the river. Um, and this is a snap fold. Like, this is one of these places where, again, it's really easy to convince yourself, oh, you know... I'm I agree with you. It, it was and, just a misclick. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of these places where, first off, people don't bluff. It's a very rare bluffing spot. Second off, he doesn't really have very many bluffs because he checked the turn, which generally means he has something, or he's giving up with bluffs. Um, and so it's, it's just, yeah. And then on top of that, we have a crappy bluff catcher because we block, you know, some random bluffs maybe, but we don't block flushes. Um, we don't, we do block straight, I guess. We block kick 10, but we don't block flushes. So it's strictly worse bluff catcher than we had on our uh, yep. <laughs> uh, can, yep. Can I tell you about my thought process there? It, yeah. The, it's, uh, it's, it's real talk. It's, uh, it, I, I think those bet check bet lines to me, it, it's like same as in, as in, uh, I don't really believe them. It's, they're kind of like bullshit to me. It's it just doesn't make too much sense. I mean, it, it's kind of like the same when you're in real life, you know, I mean, you you get into a, rela a relationship uh, with a girl and then you just, I don't know, you give it to her good for like a few years and then on the turn you just, uh, you know, you check behind, you, you tell her, Let's, uh, fuck it, I'm out of here, I'm gonna ha go have sex with dudes now and you just uh, get out, out of there and on the river then you like come back to her and say, oh my god, I'm so into you now, so no, I'm gonna bet now again, like, I, I just don't th think the story makes any sense. But, I mean, that's the thing, like, it doesn't really make sense as a bluff either. It's like, well, why would you give up I've on just, turn? I've just you noticed so many players, weaker players, who just bet the flop, they check the turn when they get called, and when it's checked to them again, they go like, okay, I have to win the bot now somehow. I wouldn't make the call against someone who's a decent player, but I've yeah, just noticed... Those weaker players will generally just decide, you know... They just give up. They don't. They're not thinking too much about winning the pot. Even. I mean, you know, some of the very worst players. You know, they gave up on the turn because they thought they weren't getting enough bolts, so they just give up. Um, I mean, people. The average player under bluffs in almost every spot. So it's one of these places where um, it doesn't really make sense much as value either. Um, I mean, look at it. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is a great spot for you and, and all you guys to, to look into your database. Filter for this specific setup. Bet, check, bet. Filter for show, showdown, hand, and, you know, uh, saw showdown. And see, you know, take a little notebook and see what percent you saw value, what percent you saw error. Um, for my work with the population tendencies, I'm convinced this is one of these spots where in the population under bluffs. But it, it's one of these weird places where there's sort of like a polarization in the population. There are some players who use this as a bluff a lot, both regs and recreationals. But then there's a little bit more players who basically never use it as a bluff. And so it's one where, you know, read lists, we probably lean towards zero folding, but as soon as we get some reads that you might be in that subpopulation that bluffs more, yeah, we can check call sometimes. Um, although again, even here, like, we've got so many better bluff catchers. This one's like complete crap. Like, uh, even if you want to bluff catch sometimes, why would we pick, you know, this week of a hand? Um, having extra showdown helps because recreationals bet all sorts of weird things as a bluff. Um, having a blocker to the flush helps. 
you know, there's so many ways we can make our hand better, better pair or better or blocker. So there's really just. Well, it, I, I bet it definitely depends on the run out, but we do reduce a bunch of these asexes by the action, by the limp butt. So, uh, yeah. but but you still think it's just too often a queen or. Yeah. But, he starts watches, he starts to pair, jack seven, seven five, queen, you know, there's the queen five is plausible. He still has randomly played aces. I mean, people do limp ace king sometimes. Ace queen, other aces. Um, he still has randomly played, like, king queen. Could randomly do this. Like, king queen seems plausible to me. Queen jack, queen ten. Queen jack might slow play turn. Queen ten might kind of check back turn, but then value bet river. There's still a ton of plausible... Um, you know, value hands here. So uh, I don't think that there's any reason to, um, yeah, to do anything else. Someone else said this is a decent hand to check raise all in. It's not because it doesn't have a heart. Um, we don't really want to check raise shove very many bluffs. And if we're sho shoving bluffs, it just has to have a heart here. Um, they're strictly better than every other bluff. And so might as well, you know, we're not looking to bluff all that often. So if we want to bluff sometimes, just bluff your heart. Um, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, just one of these places where, you know... Yeah, we don't need to bluff catch oh, so light. And, you know, it can be very close, but still picking your hand can be a big difference in EV. Like, picking blockers and, and, you know, a little bit more showdown. It's a difference, you know, oftentimes between, like, a big blind. Um, that's the kind of differences I've seen in river play with blocker effects. Um, sometimes they're, like, five chips, sometimes, but oftentimes they're, like, 20 in picking a better um, bluff catcher. That's a big deal. Another big blind, you know just, you know, on average. And that, that's regardless of whether you were right or wrong, bluff catching, right? Like, if your bluff catcher is a better bluff catcher by about a big blind than a worse bluff catcher, then the situations where both bluff catchers are bad, you're still doing better. And the situations where both bluff catchers are good, you're still doing better. So it's just a really easy way to kind of get a little edge. Use your decision making. I mean, we're poker players. Like, our edge comes from our ability to make decisions and evaluate hands and order them and, you know, decide what we want to play and what we want to fold. And so why wouldn't we, you know, decide to play here with slightly better hands than worse hands? No reason. Just, you know, call a little less often and play a stronger range. Um, you'll just make more money long term. Was that a limp but Finally start limping. Okay, okay. You can minerate still. <laughs> God damn it, now, now I finally limped and now it's... Yeah, see, maybe you have a low connector. This is, again, getting close. It's fine, though. I mean, 6-7 is starting to be... It is a full connector. It's starting to be in that realm of playability. It, it's really close here. Um, Alright, uh, bet the flop. Cool. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's fine. And uh, Again, a spot where check raising is actually really good. Um, this is a little bit more, you know, obviously we're pushing our boundaries of, you know, hit something. Um, all we have is a 7-eye backdoor flush draw, so this is going to be close. Um, I would probably still lean towards check raising this versus regs especially, because they will be seabedding a lot of air on this kind of texture. But, uh, but even versus a recreational, there's still room to check raise this as a block. Um, it's, people's ranges are just that wide, when they, or that weak when they limp seabed. But yeah, this is definitely marginal. <laughs> this is definitely one of the crappiest hands our, our bluff range should have ever. Because we don't have an over to the eight, we don't have backdoor straight draw equity, and we only have a three card, we have a one card backdoor flush draw, it's not super high. So yeah, this is a crap one. But just to give you an idea of how wide you can play versus let's see bets, that's still strongly worth considering. <laughs> you should still think about it uh, and look at reads. Uh, I'm limping here. Again, these high card junk hands, um, it's sort of the same reason I said, you know, we can overfold these in the big blind versus the button open, um, because they play worse versus strong ranges, whereas we can still defend low cards. Um, that's sort of the idea behind why we maybe would prefer to mid-raise low card, you know, somewhat connected hands, and limp these high card junk. Because those low cards will perform better versus calling ranges, because those calling ranges are stronger uh, than these queen threes. These queen threes will play better in those checkback pots, because you don't need as much value because ranges are weaker. So you don't have as much of a liability having an unplayable hand. You have tons of bluff spots. You have tons of easy spots to get showdown, easy thin value bets because people don't check raise. Life is so easy in a limp pot. Whereas in a min raise pot, there's not much you can do other than check back a lot. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, a lot of room to be sort of min raising the 7-6 and limping the squeak. Okay. Uh, all right. 
limping is good. Um, uh, ISO, not all in preflop with seven deuce. That's sort of a whole other topic. It, it, it can be fine. Um, you should, it's not often correct. Um, and G GTO does it with very large sizes, if that's a third of its stack about with that kind of hand. Um, in more exploitive play, there will be people who overfold to um, ISOs, but don't flat very much. They sort of play like limp shove or limp fold to a not all at ISO. Then 7-2 off is one of our best bluffing, is our best bluffing hand. Um, so there will be some cases where ISO is not all in. Um, uh, so again, I mean, SPR is another sort of aspect, right? We have to try to balance that, you know, as staff gets shell or SPR drops, and so we'll want to, you know, there'd be more incentive to limp some of those playable hands too, to keep stack down deep. Um, but like deeper, for instance, when there's, when, you know, 25 EVs, SPR doesn't impact our decision as much, it makes min-raising suited connectors better than min-raising, you know, junkie. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, once you get in these shallow stack depths, it starts getting really close. But 5-4 suited, yeah, 15 BBs, I'd, I'd start limping it for SPR reasons. But, yeah, it's, it, it gets complicated because there's multiple reasons to do stuff. Um, you know, that's one of the things of pre-flop. It's not so simplistic. There's a lot of different stuff going on. There's post-flop that impacts it, um, and there's, you know, subtle post-flop stuff that can impact pre-flop. Um, so, uh, and there's a lot of closeness. Uh, in EVs in general, so, yeah. Anyways, uh, we'll limp calling range of queen X off. Um, yeah, I, I limp call it queen A off, but even that you can consider folding. SPR is stack to pot ratio, so it's like how much, how many pot size bets left are there post flop? It's exactly that. So if SPR is one, it just means there's one pot size bet left. Lower SPRs mean there's less bets left. Um, lower SPRs tend to um, lower the value of drawing hands um, and also lower the uh, value of positional edge. And so as you get uh, lower SPRs, um, hands sort of play more like their equity. High card value starts mattering more. Out of being in position or out of position starts being less important. Uh, well, actually kind of the opposite. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's more just serves the purpose of having some semi-bluffs in our mid-raise range. Having hands that, you know, benefit when your opponent doesn't three-bet you and folds too much to your mid-raises. Um, so it's more about that. Um, while still, you know, having some value when called. It's the concept of semi-bluffing. You know, you, you want to get some folds and some, um, you know, not get raised and then have some value when called. Um, so... I mean, it's really important that, to remember that GTO is exploitive. Um, GTO is an exploitive process. Uh, and if you're not thinking about GTO exploitively, you're sort of not thinking about it correctly. GTO ex is the maximally exploitive solution for when your opponent is trying to exploit you. It's just, you know, under that condition. And then that's like full GTO. But then we can think about restrictions where, you know, our opponent's forced to do something or, you know, can only exploit us in these ways or has some fixed range here, but then we don't know what happens afterwards. And it'll try to maximally exploit that. Um, and so, in a sense, it's, you know, we exploit as much as we can of as many assumptions as we can um, without assuming too much about particulars of what they'll do with which hand. Um, you know, by, by allowing yourself, you know, to, to be a little bit more balanced, you're able to actually exploit a wider variety of situations. Um, so the reason GTO uses balance and, and has all this balance concept to it is actually exploitive as well. Um, it has to be balanced to exploit its opponent, in a sense. Um, because if it wasn't balanced, then its exponent would exploit it, but it also wouldn't be making as much money anyways. So it's, a, it, it's, it's one of those things where you, know, you don't want to think about balance in isolation. You know, it's bad to say, you know, I want, I did this to balance my range. That has no value. I did this because I thought it would, you know, increase the value of my strategy is what you want. I did this because I thought the option was um, better or just as good as my other options. Um, that's why you make decisions. And balance can sort of result from wanting to make plus EV decisions, you know, um, when your opponent, when you're uncertain as to what your opponent's going to do. I didn't know if my opponent was going to overfold or underfold. So I bluffed sometimes, and I've, you know, I value bet everything, and I bluffed sometimes. 
That way, if he overfolded, I still had some bluffs, and if he underfolded, I, you know, wasn't bluffing that much, right? And so I made money no matter what. Uh, and that's sort of the idea. Like when you're in times of uncertainty, when you're not sure what to do, um, then balance can be a way to maximize your evening. But in the end, we should still be thinking about balance exploitively, um, trying to do it for reasons that make sense. So like if we want to check back a nutted hand, it's not to balance our check back rank. It's because we think our opponent's going to be, and it's not to balance our check back rank. It's because we think our opponent's going to be probing big sizes very often, barreling off, putting lots of money into the pot. And so you want to check back your trap to make money from that. Um, yes, it's balancing your check back rate. You can call it that. But really what you're doing is trying to make more money by checking it back rather than c-betting it. And that's a much better way to think about balance in general. All right. Uh, 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 I have a little question in here. If, uh, let's say your opponent has the same stack size, but you have a, a, a hand like 3-5 off here. And uh, how shallow do you want your opponent to be that you start just checking back your bottom pairs because you get check shot too much? It's a good question. I mean, it's one of those things that's sort of bill independent. Um, the more reads you have as to, you know, the, their ability to check raise, the deeper, in a sense, we'll start checking it back. Um, but oftentimes, I mean, if you think about it, like, from a sort of SPR point of view or, or just thinking about analogous situations, if you live 10 big blinds deep and they check back, um, you have the same pot stack to pot ratio, same sort of situation as if you min raise 20 big blinds deep and got called. So, you know, people maybe don't play exactly the same way, but it's worth sort of thinking, well, 10 BBs is still pretty deep. If they're like check shoving a lot, 20 BBs deep in a min raise pot, are you really even all that upset that you see that lot up there? <laughs> right? Like, they're making such a big strategic mistake that are we even that concerned? Probably not. So I generally start maybe around 7 BBs, 8, 7, but, you know, with reads of aggression, maybe 9, maybe 10. Um, you know, of course, if we have reads of aggression deeper, then we'll always check it back at some point. But, uh, but generally, somewhere around 7 BBs is when I start being really careful. And especially 6 BBs, 5 BBs, you'll be limping hands, and you have to be very careful when you flop pairs and draws to check the back. Um, and so, it, 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 yeah. Um, but obviously, I mean, it's still, still going to be better than open folding a lot of the time. So uh, it's still really good to lift those hands. Oftentimes, you know, the five, six BBs. You just have to be aware that you have to check back a little more. That's fine. Um, yeah. So here we would check back if we had reads of higher check raise, or we're much shallower and around seven BBs. Oh uh, yeah. So it's fine. A so, lot of different sizes work well here. Min I like min raising here sometimes just to get really wide ranges and induce extra spew. Um, some players are really susceptible to it. Uh, you will get called a lot and have to play post. But I mean, what do you do with your bluffs here if you had land like 5-4 off? Would you also just mean nice of it? You could. Um, you could also just not bluff. I mean, I'm mid-ISOing because I think my opponent's calling too often to a mid-ISO. So at that point, I don't really need to bluff. But I mean, well, I guess someone who's, who's, who's capable of folding... But what about against some regs you, who you know that also limp fold a decent amount? Then uh, what sizing do you use there? Well, I mean, if they fold to my min raise, then I'm fine min raising. Mean, if they over fold to my min raise, then I'm even happier min raising blocks. You mean min um, a min ISO? Min ISO, sorry, yeah, which would be a min raise here to eight. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean again, if you're looking to be balanced versus regs, then I think our optimal size here is like T55. Sorry, 100. Sorry, it's about 2.5. 2.6x like or something. It's a little bit bigger than 2.5x. So it would be like uh, 110, I think. Here. Oh no, 105. But whatever. That's one optimal sizing, and another one is 150. But if, <laughs> uh, if... So it's a little bit bigger than 150. So, um, so there's like, you know, there's going to be two sizes GTO uses, and, and it does use a little bigger sizes um, in order to make uh, more hands indifferent between calling and folding. And to try to get uh, sort of a bigger region of. Um, uh, equities to be indifferent. It uses slightly bigger size, but in practice, EVs run really close. It's sort of whatever makes you comfortable. Um, I like min raising because there's because uh, I feel really comfortable playing post versus recreationals. And again, I, I really like win rate maxing and trying to squeeze out as many post flop spots out of my opponent as possible. Um, so I slightly prefer making the pot a little smaller, leaving myself you know 
but to getting a wider range. And, and sometimes it do see, inducing some crazy limb shoves and stuff. Yeah, I guess I was, see it's, it's really wide flat. I was worried too much about being balanced because I know with my bluffs I would also race the same sizing. But yeah, it's I mean, probably... You're playing Reapless. They don't know what's yeah, 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 yeah. They don't know your yeah. range. So, um, you know, when you're playing Reapless, you're trying to exploit the reads you have on the population maximally. Um, because there's no way for them to re-exploit you. At least while you're Reapless. Once you start getting reads and they're getting reads too, you can start... You know, thinking, but uh, but why are reapless? I mean, that's what you want to be trying to do as much as possible. You want to try to get reaps. You know, you want to get out of being reapless as soon as possible. Um, but while you are reapless, you just you know maximize your whatever your strategy you think is that's best versus the um, you know versus the sum of all players. Uh, I mean, you can think of it as playing like you know rather than playing the player reapless, you're playing against a range of players that represents population, and uh, you know. It's the same concept as rather than, you know, putting your opponent on a hand, put them on a range of hands. Do the same thing with, you know, villain categorization. Don't just immediately... So your population one. read is that they don't fold much to ISOs, right? To min ISOs. Min ISOs, okay. But to 2.5x yeah. ISOs? Yeah, 2.5x is really close. Um, I found that in general, I found EVs of, of ISOing and checking back being very similar with bluffs. I did it a lot for a long time because I saw over high folding frequencies. The thing is that checking back is also really good. Um, that's sort of what I found, is that checking back has really high value versus recreational players, because you're just going to play well posed. They have a crappy range, and you can play pretty well versus that post, especially if you, you know, are, are pretty fluent with your defending ranges versus C-bets and stuff like that. So, um, so there's a lot of room where checking back is also really good. Uh, and so I found that EVs are really close. And, and I basically dropped out most of my ISO bluffing versus recreationals. I just don't bother. Um, it's a little higher variance. EV's close. I'm fine just checking back and playing post. But it's not a great habit to be in if you're you know, going to be playing regs a lot. Because versus regs, it, oftentimes, it's extremely important to have bluffing ranges. Um, otherwise, they're able to you know, really exploit you not having an ISO bluff range. Uh, but recreationals tend to... Not really worry about but that. Too. I will just being a whole bunch of different hands because you're, you know, not isoing them. I'm going to just so, answer one question. Uh, Core fans asks, are you going to play today too? Yeah, at the end of the stream or at, at the end of the coaching session, then uh, yeah, I'm going to come back with a delay and play yeah, for a few fun. hours as well. But I have one more question about uh, if I was in villain's shoes, if I, let's say, I limp a hand like check five off there. And my op mm -hmm. opponent on the deep blinds decides decides to min iso me. Should uh, how wide should I be calling? So, I, I mean, check five off. Would, would you call there against the min iso? No, I'd be folding quite a bit. Um, it's it's again sort of similar. You kind of want to approach it similarly to again like facing a button open when in the big blind. Yes, you've got pot odds. Uh, you're you in that position, so you can think of that as like giving you better pot odds. But if your opponent's range is really strong, which they generally tend to be, ISO ranges tend to be value heavy. Players ISO fold less often than they should. They have stronger ranges in general. They tend to be more high card heavy, more you know value heavy in general than they sort of should be. Um, you get to hero fold junky stuff that doesn't play well. So you know, but you get good pot odds, so you can still flat stuff like you know a lot of suited hands, a lot of low connectors. So I'd probably fold jack five off, but you could probably deal five four off if you, especially if you're deep enough to get more positional edge. Maybe at this stack depth, we'd maybe fold five four off, um, but we could maybe deal, you know, king two off would be pretty close. Ten three um, suited, for ten, example. Ten three, uh, yeah, ten three suited. I'd probably just fold, but it would be close. Oh. Uh, but you'd definitely be playing like nine five suited, eight five suited, seven four suited, five three suited. Um, so there's a lot of room to play a lot of those kind of suited live cards, but uh, you have to be quite careful of some of the high, high card junk. Um, but if you were like, reasons, if you were like, <laughs> if you were like 20 B plus deep or 18 B plus deep, then your, uh, what would you be your defending range then against the mid ISO? It's wider. The ranges tend to be weaker, and you have more, you know, post flop edge. So then I just try to call stuff that's live. You know, I'll call a little bit more high card for stuff, like I'll call some queen highs. But um, still fold those I'll six two soft type of hands. Still fold the bottom line range. I okay. still have a folding range. Okay. We should still be folding a decent amount um, of our jump. We can call some stuff, but uh, yeah. Okay. So, and then, yeah, you 
Facebook show is not going to be. Oh, well. Um, so, yeah, to be open shoving. Um, limping is, is generally our best bet. Uh, if you have reads, you could maybe min raise for your opponents, like really tight aggro, three bet shoving, but we don't really have that much reads. It's just been a couple. Yeah, it's one out of two, one out of two. You could maybe min raise here, but sample's still small. But read lists usually limp, call shove, flatten all, and you can even limp shove, it won't even matter. Um, is our best bet. And um, recreationals don't ISO that much, so like trapping just from the preflop part isn't that good compared to, you know, maybe versus a more balanced player. But they play bad post, so there's not that much regret to them checking back uh, when you have King Queen anyways. So Limping still gets a similar, you know, a little bit higher frequency of hands getting it in or, or ISOing than would have called your open shove. Um, and you get it to play post, and it's usually a really pretty good thing versus recreational to do that. Uh, so clear check back. Um, yeah, we're just check folding down. We've got just complete John. But with a little showdown on the river. We we got showdown. Sweet. Land, bluff. Yeah. We would, again, if we had reads, our opponent's been like looser or aggro and let the pots, we could check back. But read less, it's a clear bet. Hold out a lot of our hands. Um, there's value bet. I think it's going to be a lot better to value bet here. There's going to be too many pairs and draws that he checks back, but would call a bet with. So, just get some value. And I guess on the river... But I mean, if you, if you bet the turn and you get called, uh, are you still going for two streets of value against two pair hands? Or, I mean, he definitely does have some king x there as well. Or... Yeah, on the river you could either block bet or check fold. Once you bet the turn, we'd either block bet or check fold river. Okay. And, uh, yeah, as played, again, you could actually block bet here too. It's a cool spot to stab out 25. You can min bet. In theory, you could min bet, but in practice, people go a little bit extra crazy versus min bet. So a little bit more than min bet, 22 chips, 25 chips. You can block right here. There's still random two pair that will call you. There's straights that are worse that call. So it's um, just better to bet there. Yeah, yeah. yeah but check fold's yeah. fine. As long as you have all, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Uh, Lim, um, this is actually on the thin side. For what it's worth, this is a really bad board for us. This is why I kind of talk about, with, you know, recognizing board textures and stuff. It's a really bad board for us in the limb pot, um, especially this shallow. So this is actually quite thin. But we're shallow. We've got a good, good enough top pair in a limb pot. It's fine. But it's worth noting this is thin, and we probably want to check back 9-7, probably 10-7. We don't want to bluff on this board. We want to check back tons. Um, uh, it's actually a board where our opponent should be donking, but we'll donk. Uh, and oh wait, yeah. can, can you go back to the last time? I have one more question about um, if you're in Milan's shoes, you you have just a bunch of like five x five x three x cut shots with a whole bunch of hands. So when you check and your opponent bets half pot there, uh, are you calling all your gut shots? Because I mean you have a ton of those. Yeah, probably. You can check raise some of them in theory, but yeah. Um, I mean, in practice, people would see that weak ranges and don't barrel very well on turns. So we don't have to be particularly tight. And again, I mean, you get to play really wide ranges, one pots, gut shots, tend to be calls in most cases anyways. So, so, so yeah. I have like check three, you're going to check call there? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, with reads, like, I mean, it's one of those things where we're doing it for the same reason we're not donking on these boards. It's because people see that too much and too weak ranges. Um, on the other hand, if you know if you were playing against me, you probably should be actually folding them. Um, and in fact, versus my range, probably all of your fours and sixes without a backdoor flush draw are probably folds. Um, if I know you're not donking, um, I can make it so that you should be check folding pairs of fours and sixes without a flush draw, without a backdoor flush draw. So, and a gut shot, of course, or draw otherwise. But uh, so, so that's something I think about, that like there is room to play. Like your range is really strong when you check on this river. So if your opponent is sort of, um, you know, betting appropriately strong um, and trying to get you to fold like, you know, a normal frequency, that normal frequency will convert to a lot of strong hands. Uh, or, well, strong, weakly strong hands. Um, because if you want to fold 40% of a strong range, you're going to be folding a lot stronger hands than if you were folding 40% of a crap range. 
So the fact that we have all these gut shots of pairs means in total we have more stuff. And so if our opponent knows that, he's going to be adjusting his c-betting so that we can't just call all that stuff um, and by making their range more value heavy. And so, you know, versus stronger players, we might need to fold some of that stuff or start thinking about donking so that we weaken our range when we check and then that forces villain to start c-betting more. But, but those are pretty rare situations where your opponent is good enough to like adjust to these low card boards and adjust to your sort of tendencies on them. So uh, for the most part, we just check calls sort of tendencies on them. So uh, for the most part, we just check calls. Wait, wait, did I just uh, fold there? Can I go back? Did I see that? Did, did I fold to 10B blank jam there with King 8? Isn't that a call? Um, no, I mean, it. well, okay, it's a Nash call, right? Um, it's, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. We can actually see the guy's stats. He, he was just limping a whole bunch of his range and not really raising much. So that's probably why I folded, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an ash call. It's a uh, you know versus a red, you'd be a snap. Um, but recreational stuff, stronger ranges, and there is still a strong aspect of winner boxing. Um, our stacks are you know we still have a relatively big stack compared to his. We've got about you know two thirds of his stack or so. So there's still a lot of win rate maxing that comes in up right here. It's too. also the, I think my main reason was there, if, if you look at look at his pre-flop race, he's raised only one out of nine hands and, and he's basically limping everything he has. So yeah. does that mean that he's open shocking? Like remember, that's not, like, it's very tempting sometimes to use, like, frequencies really directly to translate into ranges. But, I mean, on the other hand, you have to remember, just because he's limping a lot, doesn't mean he isn't maybe limping extra value hands that don't open shove, right? And, and maybe he has a small open shove range, maybe it's low frequency, but maybe it's all bluffs. A lot of regs use that strategy where they um, they limp a lot of you know really strong hands, and so the limping frequency is high because they actually over limp tracks, and then they um, they open shove a pretty low frequency because it's weighted towards semi bluffs and a little bit of thin value, you know, some low pocket pairs, low ace acts, and semi bluffs. And suddenly their range is really capped, and they're you know you want to call it off even wider because he's open shoving so little and limping so much. Um, so be really cautious with you know translating you know being too quick to translate you know high frequency equals weak range, low frequency equals strong range. Um, there's many cases where that's very far from true, and there's lots of places where you know players can manipulate you if you're liable to, to thinking that way. Um, and they can use a strategy where they make sure that all their bluffing ranges are low frequency to confuse you, to make you always overfold. Um, and then they keep their you know, stronger ranges higher frequency so that you always overcall. And you're like, oh my god, you know, this guy bets all the time, and I keep calling, and I keep losing, and I must be just running terrible. When really they've just been betting value all the time. And uh, you know, have been in places where you, you thought they'd never bluff, you, they've been old. Um, and so it's, you know, there's a lot of room where you have to be kind of careful with these kind of translations. But, uh, but yeah, so here, I mean, we're readless. It's just, you know, population shoves a little too tight. We've got winner rate maxing. Yeah, it's fun. So it's what's the weakest pretty... king you call there? Weakest king? Well, no. what, yeah, what's your general uh, range there on 10B plans? What, what are you calling there? Uh, I haven't looked. Uh, I feel a little bit bad because I haven't looked up population tendencies in this spot a while. Um, I go through it in detail in my math in um, Heads Up Sit and Go's package, and a little after I put that out, one of my students did it for a lot of stack depths, and I haven't really done the math since then other than just a little bit of approximating, so I don't actually have a perfect range here, it's one of the things that... But I mean, uh, your approximation, yeah. it still helps. <laughs> it's... But, uh, so my, my first guess would be something like um, Ace-Deuce off, King-Nine off, uh, Queen 10 off and Queen Jack off are actually really close, but their calls less than 10, I think. Um, you can probably hear a full Jack 10 off, but again, it's really close. Uh, on the seated side, Ace 2 suited. Um, probably something like King 7 suited, King 5 suited. It's somewhere in that region. Uh, queen 9 suited. Queen 8, yeah, Queen 8 to fold. Queen 9 suited is going to call, though. Um, Jack nine suited it's going to be a call. Ten nine suited it's going to be a call. Um, and you can probably hear a full ten eight suited, although that's another close one. Um, so yeah, you, you can fold quite a bit uh, in these kind of places versus recreational. Versus regs, you got to call a lot more. Um, all right. We, uh, we, yep. so, 
maybe is this one of those spots where you might want to check behind your draw because you get check shoved too much by pocket pairs because the stacks are like 8 B plans effective right now so I mean we, yeah. I meant on the flop yeah I just wanted to quickly mention that someone asked you know in a 2x passing thin, thin plus EV spot in my opinion is a mistake um, again it really depends on um, what you're trying to maximize um, are you trying to maximize your raw EV hourly are you trying to maximize your EV ROI are you trying to maximize you know your bankroll growth all of these actually lead to slightly different considerations. Um, if you're trying to maximize your win rate or ROI, or equivalent, um, then then you want to then you then there are places where passing up small edges is mathematically correct. You know you can run simulations and, and you know there's I've done some of the math. Um, the effects can be quite high even in hypers. Uh, to give you an idea, um, 25 BB deep, um, a recreation, you know, first hands recreational open shoves. If you're assuming you have about 52 to 53 percent win rate, then um, you know, and you put in a range for your opponent to open shove. You put into coffee calcs or poker stove, or whatever, and you get the range that you know is plus EV to call chip EV. It turns out that you can pass up edges up to like, over a big blind and a half. It has to be a big blind and a half better called than folded according to coffee calcs to actually make it a call. So the effects can be very big. Um, they're biggest with calling shoves. Um, they do affect open shoving though. For instance, open shoving twos is hurt by like 0.2 big blinds compared to chip EV if you're trying to maximize win rate EV. Um, but there are a lot of places where it does make, you know, reasonable impact. 0.2 BBs is enough to change your strategy with a hand too. So um, it does affect min raising and limping compared to open folding and compared to each other. There's a lot of subtle places it comes into play. Um, but yeah, I mean, in some sense, uh, you know, if we're looking to uh, you know, play the two X's, try to, you know, get a little bit better maybe EV per hour ratio by playing faster in two X's, um, you know, having lower win rate, a little bit lower win rate than we could have, but making the game length shorter. Yeah, we can kind of crank up a little bit our, our average, um, uh, you know, for prize pool in some sense that we see. And um, there are minor benefits to that, but there are also minor benefits to win rate maxing in two X's. Uh, you get a lot more, less variance. Um, it lower because it increases your win rate. It lowers just like your bulk variance of your bankroll, um, and it has other sort of aspects on how it affects variance. It affects variance in sometimes non-subtle ways. So, um, so win rate maxing can be a way to uh, you know pass up on a little bit of EV hourly for a little bit more EV sanity hourly, <laughs> right? I mean, there's a lot of room where you know just having a, you know being able to squeeze out an extra buy-in per session could make us feel enough better um, about grinding, about you know, our mental game and stuff like that, that it could be worth it. You know, even if we're passing up on you know, maybe 0.1 binds an hour, but we've got that little bit better hourly, that could actually make more than the difference of that 0.1 binds an hourly if we're not tilting off a buy in every session. So it's, it's complicated stuff, it's subtle, and there's a lot of room to, again, it depends a lot on what you want. Um, it depends on what you want to maximize. There's a lot of different things you can maximize. You know, design. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, one thing it doesn't depend on, because it's a pet peeve of mine, is rake. Uh, if anyone ever tells you anything related to rake as related to an in-game strategic decision. If someone tells you rake depends, you know, ch changes how wide you should call a shove or anything like that, it is a complete lie. Rake has nothing to do with it. It's a sunk cost. Rake only affects the decision we make when we register for the game. That's it. Once we've registered, we're assuming we're going to be maximizing something. We're assuming we're plus EV in that game. That's why we registered. And registry, you know, rake affects whether registering is profitable or not. It never affects any in-game decisions. The, you know, the magnitude of rake has no bearing whatsoever. Um, so, just something to mention. Um, all right. Uh, we limp super standard limp call shove. Um, yep, that's right, my call shove, but it's a call shove. <laughs> this is a ragged. So you would prefer just limp calling a shove and not shoving it preflop, right? Oh, it's much better. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's better in, in balance play, and it's again better versus recreationals. Um, especially since the kind of shoving ranges, like when we open shove, we fold out low cards, whereas when we limp, we often induce low cards to bluff shove. And we dominate low cards. 
So every time we get the guy to bluff shove seven deuce off or five four suited or even you know queen deuce off as in the animal world, uh, we are happy. But um, the queen ten off, you would just shove it pre flop or? It's still close. Um, but the offshoot ones, you generally slightly prefer shoving just because they're not as playable. But there's a lot of room to still live queen ten off, queen jack off, and let them call a shove. Um, because even if your opponent doesn't ISO a lot, they ISO bad ranges, and they play bad post, which can still increase the idea of limping versus open shoving. Um, open shoving has sort of kind of like a static value. Um, it's, I mean, it's a little bit better than like GTO open shoving, because, you know, recreationals will have a worse calling range. But on average, most people play less bad versus all wins than versus not all wins. Um, you know, generally, call open shove ranges aren't so awful these days. More people have access to Nash, you know, more people have general idea of what they should be calling, what they should be folding. Call open shove ranges aren't so bad. But do you like, so shove ranges tend to be much more of a mess, post swap play tends to be more of a mess. Uh, do you limp a uh, hand like Queen 9 off and Queen 8 off here as well, or do you open shove them? Um, at this stack depth, it's getting close. Um, it probably still, with, with the range we have of this passive range, I would still unfold them. Okay. Uh, but if you're not sure whether it's a limp fold or limp call shove, just open shove. It's not a bad rule of thumb. If you're like you're getting uncertain, you're like, I don't know if I would have to like if I limp this, do I have to call a shove? Then just open shove. Um, uh, unless you know it's a clear call, and then you can limp and just make a clear call. Um, so yeah, uh, and so like I said min raising. I guess min raising isn't bad either. People don't free bet enough, so min raising sort of works kind of okay as a semi-bluff. Um, you're getting a good amount of folds. You still have to call a shove. Um, the biggest difference between min-raising and limping here is that you generally get less bluffing when you min-raise. Like, people three-bet shove much more high card heavy ranges. They'll shove all their king high and maybe all their queens. But they maybe won't shove, you know, seven deuce off, God forbid, but five four suited even. Um, whereas when we limp, we get a lot more pure bluffs, ISO shoving. So. Um, so you get a really good range ISO shoving into you too. Um, and so that's sort of the idea. Uh, yeah, because even, yeah, someone says, does great against bluff, yeah, you got this big bluff, you're happy, if they shoved in value, you've got equity, it's just always the call, so that's nice. Uh, we've got the flop, again, we're starting to get deeper, but he's been passive, it's fine. So against someone more aggressive, you would just check back on the flop there, maybe? Drawing hands check back really well. Because uh, they like, check shove too many pairs on the flop. It's... Yeah, and then essentially they don't check call enough. When we're semi-bluffing, like the whole point of semi-bluffing is that you have like, you know, value when called. If your opponent doesn't call very much, then there's not a lot of value in semi-bluffing. Right? If you just check shoving and check folding, it's like, well, uh, maybe I would just rather bet air. <laughs> um, which is often true. So yeah, be a little you know, critical here. There is room to check back draws. It can be very, very good. Um, in GTO play, both limping, uh, both checking back and C betting are both used in almost every situation. Um, this, these are almost always in different hands because um, they sort of have to be in both ranges uh, or they get to be in both ranges really profitably. In practice, try to pick what's better. Um, this is pretty close, whether we want a barrel. Uh, the big downside here is that you're never folding out queens or kings ever. So I was going after the five X's because yeah. I, I expect a bunch of stronger king X to shot pre flop. Yeah. So we probably fold out a little bit of gut shot equity. Think you, do you think he just has a lot of five X there? There's no ace high, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, this would probably not be a bad one to like even put into coffee calcs and try to figure out the ratio of fives to queens and kings. I think we're running a little low on time, so I'm not gonna bother. But. Uh, but it's, it's a good spot to kind of look. Um, generally, when you can fold out, like, two low cards, it's amazing to bluff. When you can fold out one, it's, eh, it's okay. And it'll depend a little bit on just how many, you know, kings we think check back, queens check back. Um, but it's not going to be a big deal here. And we don't expect too much check raising, so um, so it's okay to barrel your draw. You still have equity and cold. So it's not going to be a mistake, big mistake, no matter what. But it's going to run closer. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I guess sizing is fine. I mean, pretty shallow, so we can't really go any bigger than a half pot. So. And we really don't want to go smaller. That's yeah, like eight and a half babies, too. All right. No, I have check bags. Fine, fine. And, um, you should bluff the turn here, probably. Gut shots bluff really well on turns, but 
This is a little bit of a weird spot. I mean, I'm a bit scared to buff here because I think thinking yeah. thinking opponents will realize I don't have any A6 in this spot, so they might just turn something into a bluff for just always call me down with a check or a queen yeah. there. Oh, read plus, we shouldn't assume our opponent's thinking, first off. Yeah, I guess uh, his stats-wise, he doesn't uh, seem like a strong player either. Yeah, I think more to the point, like, it's pretty hard to fill that king high. We expect king high to check back bluff a good amount. Um, it's pretty hard to fill that jacks and who's so... Yeah, I think we probably could just check folds. We got a free card with a lot anyways. And, yeah, it's fine. We're not holding out King High and Ridger anyways. Alright. Um, so, uh, so, um, so, uh, some, there's still sort of talking about Jack 10 suited, why it's better than open shoving. So again, the idea is you get it in versus a better range. Um, you know, a range that has more hands you beat. Um, and then on top of that, you also get to play your hand and pose, um, and it's very playable. It has all this draw potential, so it tends to benefit a lot from playing pose. And SPR is still reasonable, right? Um, you know, it's, it's a limp pot, so you keep your SPR still reasonable, you still have a lot of money behind. And so you, that way you sort of take advantage of the fact that your hand's very, very playable. You're sort of squeezing out that edge by, by playing as much post as you can with highest... PR, um, while getting a really good setup for getting it in, while sort of getting a better range, um, you know, three ISO shoving than um, for you, better for you than uh, than if they called your open shove. So, it's the basic idea. Um, yeah, I think this is fine. There's room to bet here, but our kicker is on the marginal side. There's not that much protection either. We're getting shallows. So there's not a lot of like over cards that fold or. So, I mean, I didn't bet the flop because I figured that I, I can't really call it check raise, so... I... Yeah, I mean, you can flat it on all in check raise. It's not a big deal. Okay, it's but... still pretty deep, so again, check shoving is going to be pretty rare. I think maybe because he was so passive both flop, I should have just bet there, I guess, for protection yeah. as well, maybe? He's been tight, though, so on the other hand, how many worse hands are calling? He might be folding twos for all we know with his frequencies. <laughs> uh, probably not, but, uh, but yeah. So, you know, we're betting protection. I mean, and again, how much equity are we folding out? Like, how much value are we folding out? There's not a lot of, like, two overs that fold. Like, jack-10 is a gut shot. Queen-10, queen-jack probably doesn't check back very much. And they probably don't fold anyways. King-10 doesn't fold. So, we're not really folding out that many, like, two overs. I guess there's, like, king-8 is possible. Okay, so, so, like, checking back the 7 there, but you would bet a deuce there for more... Because that need, needs more protection. Yeah, and it probably gets a similar amount of value in calls, especially a good, good deuce. Um, it benefits a lot more from your opponent fo overfolding and not check raising. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's fine. It's committed. So, I, I mean, he, he had... Do you see his, how much he was raising preflop? I mean, from Gabe giving me the impression that his passive preflop and then he mean raises on like 10 big blinds that seems really strong, so should I even be flatting their preflop with 10-7 off? Um, yeah, I was kind of thinking there might be room to fold, but it's it's a pretty strong hand still, especially this shallow where there's not a lot of positional edge. You're still going to do okay flatting here, so it's not that big a deal. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit awkward. But I mean, once he bets big, we're, we're pretty happy just check shoving. He's more rated. He's got still a lot of over cards in his range that call a shove once he's committed here. Um, so we still have equity on call because he's got to call overs. Um, he's going to sometimes call like pocket nine, sixes. He'll sometimes call ace eight, king eight. Uh, and we do, if he folds king queen, we're sort of happy anyway. So uh, we get some protection. So it's fine. Uh, it's, it's on the borderline in terms of kickers. But I think given the range, we assume where he's got a lot of over cards, we're fine with this. Oh well. Cool. But uh, the time is. You need to yeah. go. We're, we're, yep. Oh, it's. <laughs> you yeah, have any questions? Anyone have like more general questions or anything I didn't manage to get to in the chat? Um, maybe start organizing. I'm just gonna. I ran out of uh, iced tea, so I'm just gonna run and get some more tea. I'll be like two or three minutes, okay. and then we could do uh, some general question and answer. I mean, hand straight from the group or whatever. Whatever you want to do. Alright, I'm back in a couple of minutes.
So guys, um, what about that egg ball? Are you watching that American egg ball championships that they have there? The hand egg where they just run and call it football. What about that? That's a cool game. Hand egg ball, yeah, I think that's what they call it. <clears throat> Real men play uh, European football. By the way, guys, if you uh, if you have any questions for me, like uh, then for my level of expertise is women. For example, I just I slept with so many women. That's like uh, you wouldn't even believe it. This it's more than two. It's more than two women. It's it's three women, and I mean I, I didn't go all the way with all of them, but I, I will count it as three. So you can just ask me all the questions you want. All the love cash questions will be answered. Jesus Christ, it's, it feels so much like... <laughs> it feels so weird. I'm used to streaming and talking a lot, but now I just listen to Adam all the time. And now I just feel like a viewer who is suddenly uh, in front of a camera. I don't really feel like a streamer. It's weird. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> you listened? <laughs> yeah. I just got back. Uh, yeah, I th yeah it, it's a bit awkward when you left and it was like, just quiet and I, I wasn't ready yeah. to talk. It's so weird. Can't you tell some jokes? You're supposed to tell some jokes. This is that you just missed it. Oh, okay. Oh god, and you're not supposed to say you're supposed to tell some jokes because then they're not prepared for it and then they're gonna be immune to it. That's true. Uh, Alright, yeah, I advise open shoving even deep. Um, so, I mean, I advise. I did sort of a conditions where it's good, and I, and I strongly believe it was really good at the time in the pack. Um, people, recreationals were calling way wider. Um, rags were calling way wider. There are a lot more recreationals in general, um, you know, per table. So, uh, so it was way better then, and I strongly believe it, it was like probably by far the best option at the time. Um, that being said, I think, you know, games progressed a lot since, you know, they just came out. Um, and I do think recreationals don't call nearly as wide, regs don't call nearly as wide. Um, and, and so there is a lot more value these days to mid-racing limping. Um, again, uh, win rate maxing also affects it, where even if open shoving is a little better, when you're trying to win rate max and higher multipliers, it's way worse. Higher multipliers, people call tighter too. So, yeah, there's a lot of situations where you don't want to do it. Um, that being said, I mean, if you're playing 7s, 15s, uh, you've got a 2x, and you've decided you don't want to win rate maximize, it's probably still your best option of, like, ace-king, ace-queen, maybe probably ace-jack. Um, you know, the cheap EV tends to run really good when people call wide. Um, and, like, three-handed, like, the idea is that, like, it, it's sort of like wanting to open shove ace-king off 11 BBs um, in, in a heads-up sit-and-go. Uh, the idea is, you know, you're getting a wider calling range than if you mid-raise because they don't free that shell that much, um, or versus a lip. And so you get value. Um, Three-handed, there's two people to get value from. So there is still a lot of incentive where if they call too wide, it can be really, really good to open shell value. But yes, in most cases, it's regs at the table, higher multipliers, tighter re recreationals, open shoving should be replaced by mid-raising and limping. Absolutely. Uh, limping the button might be a great person. Again, it's something where actually I think that what I said in the spin pack actually holds true. Um, that EV of min raising and limping on the button has been empirically shown to be extremely close. And so, and min raising is easier. There's, you know, you don't play as much post, there's less room for error. And so, actually, um, most of the, you know, higher volume that we have, higher sample size of results. Mid-raising tends, you know, the people who mid-raise a lot tend to do a little better, you know, especially on average. Um, you know, it's hard to say how it affects win rate maxing, there are other issues going on, but 
Um, I still think mid-raising on the button is really strong. As you get shallower, you do need to limp. I didn't really talk too much about that, yes. Um, there is, you know, as you get shallower, we will want to limp almost no matter what. But even then, mid-raising can be really strong. People overhold. Um, people have still, you know, a lot of people don't free bet nearly as much as they did when I made that pack. Back in the day, mid-raising was sort of worse because they free-bet shove more. Um, so there's still a lot of room where, um, yeah, mid-raising is a really good way to go. But yeah, limping the button can be, you know, something that you incorporate slowly into your game. Um, you know, a way to extract edge from, you know, situational place, you know, from, from, from analyzing situations correctly, from finding those places where, you know, we thought limping and mid-raising is close, but we can adapt and choose limping because we know it's better based on the reads and situation. Um, and that's, for me, that's the best way to use limping and mid-raising is to, you know, default to something and, you know, whatever makes you comfortable. You can use a strategy that has both of them in it. You can have a strategy that only min-raises. You can have a strategy that only limps and still perform great. Um, and, but then from there, be really willing to adjust to the table um, and to the reads. And then you'll do fine. And if you don't want to do that, then just always min-raise and you'll do okay anyways. 2-2, um, uh, do I have a shove for 25 BBs? Um, no. Because of win rate maxing and stuff, I, I don't. Um, I just min-raise or limp it. It's probably not the end of the world to open shove it, but I start open shoving at shower. Um, Ace-King is a min-raise call. No, Ace-King is a min-raise four bet, always. Um, it's always a call. And why would it, you know, accept versus total loose passive droolers, it's still a 4-bet show. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, more general things. Small blind, three-way, it's obviously the most difficult spot to play. Um, any basic advice? Well, I mean, is it the most difficult spot? Um, you know, facing a button open, you're folding, like, three-quarters of the time. So <laughs> that's not so hard. Uh, in some sense, like... The spots that come are difficult, but they're not very common. So, um, you know, it's not the end of the world to still, uh, you know, it's not that scary of a spot. I have any basic advice? Um, you know, when you're facing button opens, just you know, aim for a pretty tight strategy. Um, lay it towards connected hands playability. Oh, small blind versus big blind. Oh, well, I think that's, you know, it's not that difficult. I guess it's one of the places where we have the most, like, disadvantage. Um, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't sound very appropriate. What? Uh, <laughs> your Google did, some, did, did someone say something? I, yeah. Do I need to ban yeah. someone? Maybe. Someone was laughing at you, I think. I'm pretty sure Dodie the Basic was laughing at you. He even laughed out loud at you, so you might want to ban him. But, uh, but yeah, so small blind versus big blind button folds. I mean, it's it's not that much harder than big blind in a heads up sit and go. It's basically very very similar spot. A lot of the situations are analogous. I think that's the thing to really understand is that it's more similar to playing in the big blind um, in a uh, heads up sit and go than it is to playing in the small blind. Um, general advice. Uh, Versus weak players, min-raising is really, really good. Um, versus stronger players, you want to strongly consider limping more. Uh, open shoving is good, better than it is in heads up sit and go. I don't know. Try to play around two-thirds of hands, maybe a little more. Um, two-thirds of hands is like a balanced DPIB. So versus most players, you should be playing more because they don't play very well versus opens and versus other stuff. Why are you banning people? No, uh, it's uh, it's was a misclick. Oh. How do how do I unban people? I don't know. You're the Twitch guy. I have no idea. I like I wanted to see how it works. Actually, I just clicked. I did, I didn't want to click on Dodie because he was crying, so I clicked on weird stuff just to see how I could unban him. But uh, <laughs> you can't unban. It's terrible. Playing with fire. They tell you about playing God. <laughs> there's there's no option him. to um, maybe you're banned him? Let's try to ban him again, maybe that helps. Okay, it's, it's already banned. Um, <laughs> poor poor guy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're the Twitch guy. 
Oh, okay. I'm a professional oh. streamer. Now you are. Yes. Are. I should probably apologize. Man. You're welcome. You're welcome for <laughs> being a part of the show. So, alright. Um, any more questions? Um, is that an okay answer? Let's go the. It's kind of hard to you know go into detail. Like, there's a lot of stuff you can do, so it's um, never a thing. But uh, yeah. Um, in general, I think that again, the advice in the pack of when you're you know approaching it from the beginning, min raising your range is a really good way to learn because it's your range is a really good way to learn because it's lower regret. It works really well versus most planners. There's less mistakes you can make. Um, as you get better, think about limping and how it would compare to min raising and what the differences are and where you know limping would be better. And again, the same with the button. You know, try to figure out while you're min raising, try to look for places where hmm, this might be a limp spot. You can even mark it and check with others. Um, and you know, as you broaden your sort of um, situation of uh, you know how many hands you know you could, you could have been limping, you'll get a better feeling for you know when you want to start approaching limping more. Um, and it is very important versus regulars, uh, you know, higher stakes regulars um, versus lower stakes guys. I bet you can get away with still min racing and doing fine, um, especially if you're pretty good post. Um, I mean, one of the things I think that most people actually probably suffer, uh, have worse strategies probably in the big blinds than in the small blinds. I think the average player is probably more leaky in the big blinds. Um, and it mostly just comes down to overfolding, uh, especially post flop. I think one of those basic common leaks that almost everyone has is they overfold too much to small blinds events um, in the big blind. Both in limp pots and mid-rise pots. But, uh, yep. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Alright. Uh, you can tell me if you, uh, if you want to start heading out. No, I can give a couple more questions if there's any more. I would, have you, I, would, I, would, I would have you here forever. If, uh, yeah. Called, um, yeah. How uh, to play versus Maniac who three, bar four barrels every street. Yeah, I, I think uh, she was just, as, as basically right. Um, you sort of want to call, you want to fold more earlier streets. Um, in a sense, like you want to fold when you're facing a lot of barrels, but then you want to call down more once you get to those later situations. Um, by doing both, you'll end up with you know, by folding more early, like to min raises and to the C bat a little bit more, you'll end up with stronger ranges, so you don't have to fold them as much on later streets. Um, but you also want to widen a little bit how much you're willing to call. I mean, you should be willing to stack up with pairs a lot more. Um, you should be willing to peel a lot more pairs on turns and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Just try to, you know, construct your defending range. Um, try to figure out, you know, how wide you can play. Uh, order your hands. Um, you can look to check raise as well, but a lot of the times, like strategically, we probably don't want to check raise much if our opponent really crazy barrels turns in rivers, because we don't want to check raise value. So mostly we'll just check fold and check call draws and value, um, and then you know follow the same pattern on turn and river. You just call down. You know, every time you strengthen your range a little bit, you should always have a folding range. Um, basic, basically always, uh, especially on flop and turn. Um, so it's always worth folding the bottom of your range and calling the top parts. And yeah, it's a little bit of a trick to evaluating, you know, which hands are stronger than others. You know, how does a flush draw compare to a bottom pair? How does bottom pair plus gut shot compare to middle pair? Stuff like that. Um, but you can research some of that in here. All right. Uh, do a live sesh. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, heads up for rolls. Yeah. If you're on black chip, we could play, we could play turbo or something. What am I? I am uh, scared for my life. I, 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 I would uh, just uh, get a heart attack. Oh, okay. Well, if you're a coward, then that's fine. I'm, uh, I'm more than a coward. I'm the cat bird. Yeah. What's the other yeah. word for cat? I'm more of uh, something like that. But, uh, hey Adam, Adam, yeah. can I call you Adam? Because we're yeah, sure. kind of like uh, friends now. My name? Uh, knock knock. Who's 
what it what did you say what is what did you say uh, I mean I mean we've been doing this session for almost two hours now you don't even know my name right I mean I just always I just I guess it's just all on me because I uh, I guess I always get my hopes up when I just uh, meet a cool guy I just always think that uh, you know, wow we just found like we we're gonna possibly be best friends forever and and it's just always it it always ends the same way it's it's when I when I tell them knock knock they always say like who's there I don't know you and it, and it's always in front of other people as well it's like they're embarrassed embarrassed to be friends with me in public it's it just hurts it hurts yeah yep I remember your two plus two screen name it's uh Pai Hu Kahu Kahu Kalu Pai Hu Pai Hu Kalu right? yeah I always I always get nice I, I know it's Pai Hu because I, I made sure to get that right for my post so I know it's Pai Hu and I think the end is it might be Kahu Kahu K H A R Y U or something might be shorter though something like that though so you know I remember your your uh, your name more or less. No, I always get I get sick pleasure out of it to have Americans just pronounce my name. They, they always butcher it so hard, but for, <laughs> it's really unpronounceable, I guess. Is it like piha? Uh, in Estonian, it's piha garo. Piha, piha garo. Yeah, it, it, we have this word, uh, this letter u, which yeah. you, you don't have in your language, so it's. Okay. Yeah, but it's piha. No, it's Buha. Say it, they say it the correct way. Say it like an Estonian would say it. So how is it? Piha? It's Buha Garo. Say it perfectly. You have to say it perfectly uh, like an Estonian says it. Uh, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, Polish American says it, try to you know, use some of my Polish together with some of my English. Piha Garo. Yeah, that was actually good. That was, that was a good one. Yeah. But you can call me Carl because we are best friends forever now. So, uh, so you might as well call me for my uh, with my real name. All right, Carl. Well, so uh, are there really no more questions? You can do another one or two. Maybe you have some like fun hand history or something. You can do like one more last hand history of it. Yes, I would love that. Actually, I was hoping for you to say that because we are best friends now, so we read each other other's minds. So, of course. Yes. So, uh, can you go to the? Uh, can you do it yourself? <laughs> uh, just choose uh, the next hand history, maybe. Is it uh, one of these guys you picked? Oh, okay, this is. This oh, I think this was 15, so. Um, uh, oh, maybe we should start at the beginning. So we Wait, forward. I have to change it up. This is yeah. Alright. Oh, yeah, so I can see it. What is the lowest pair you live trapped 12 BBs deep? Um, pocket 4s is close. Pocket 5s for sure is a trap. Pocket 4s you can consider. 3s um, and 2s you're shoving at that time. Anything about PS in New Jersey? No. Not that I know. Uh, so on, on the flop here we do have the Cutshot plus the vector diamonds, but I feared that I don't know our stack size is so small that does it. That's a small. 20 BB deep versus him. I mean, he did dunk quite big here, so I should probably be still check calling, or I mean, he did dunk in three ways. Probably. Um, I mean, obviously, like, because he dunked three ways, his range is stronger. But yeah. again, when you have a drawing hand, it's not really that big a deal. Because, yes, it means he's got a barrel turn more often, and you'll have to fold. But it also means that when you hit, he'll barrel turn more often and he'll get more implied odds. So hitting the turn is more profitable. Hitting rivers when he checks back is more profitable when he has more value. Um, there's a lot of bad cards where he shuts down. So, um, yeah, I think we can still call But I mean, if, if, I, if I check call now, it's, it leaves him for a bot size bet left on the turn. So I think he's shoving his queen X quite often on the turn. But I, does it really it's matter fine. that much? Yeah, well, again, like, that's fine for us. Because that means that whenever we hit a straight, we get paid, right? With a bot size bet. It's about how much we need left over. Um, 
mean, a good rule of thumb is uh, so if we a good rule of thumb is that your your capture factor um, on any street actually of the draw in hand of like the drawing part of your equity is um, the percent of your equity that comes from draws, i.e., how often you expect to get there. You know, have the nuts. So if we calculated here, well, we can't use it. Um, but we know that what we've got uh, four outs, so about 16%. Um, and it's that times whatever you think the capture factor, or you know, however much you think you'll win on an average river spot with that hand, however much the pot. So we know that there's about one pot size of that left. So that's about the most we can earn is one pot size. But we probably often have it. Um, there's not a lot of uh, room to be dirty because ace king is, you know, not in his range, probably. King-9 is somewhat plausible. Um, we stack him a pretty fair share of the time between turn and river once we hit. So, um, so you end up with, you know, you know, even pessimistically, maybe one and a half times the pot. That's sort of stacking half his pot uh, when you get the nuts. And so if you multiply one and a half, uh, that capture factor times the equity on the flop, or your drawing equity, you end up with about how much capture factor you have. Uh, and then you compare that to your odds, um, just like you would pot odds. So here, if we multiply 1.5 uh, times um, times what is it, 16% uh, uh, about, you end up with about 24%. So, um, so we almost have enough just with our gut shot. It's a little close here because we're shallow. If we have more money behind, generally gut shot will be able to earn as much as 30% of the pot. It'll be more like 1.8 times um, times the 16% or so and you'll be closer to like 30% equity uh, capture factor. But here we have about 23% just from our gut shot. Um, that doesn't count any capture factor from eights or nines, which is a little bit, maybe five, 10% of the pot. Um, it doesn't, and it also doesn't count, more importantly, the backdoor flush draw. Uh, it turns out the backdoor flush draw is about 3% equity. And again, uh, flushes, they're generally worth even more than straights. So it's generally a bonus of about five to 6% capture factor having a backdoor flush draw. So you have like 23-ish, maybe 24, plus the 5, and you know, we'll end up with somewhere around 29, 30% capture factor here. Somewhere between 27, 29. It's going to be close. Like it's not a big mistake to fold here. It's only a little bit better called than folded, but it's going to be better called than folded. Um, most of the time gut shots are. Here is range is stronger, but our gut shot is stronger because we have a backdoor flush draw. Um, it's worth noting that backdoor flush draws are good for like a lot of reasons. Um, Notice that if you hit it, there's so many ways to hit gut shot plus flush draw as well, or open ender plus flush draw. Seven of spades, diamonds comes and you improve massively. The you know the, the just any old diamond, deuce of diamond comes and you have a combo draw. So these backdoor equity effects are really strong. Um, gut shot effects are really strong. Draws are generally just strong hands. Um, and uh, yeah, in case you thought the map was hand wavy, it is. It's a weird like theorem consequence. Um, it's not actually like as logical as it sounds. It's like, well, wait, why is our like capture factor like now related to what it is on the river times our percent of getting to the river? You know, what about turn play? Well, it turns out that turn play kind of like averages out to where that still holds to. Um, and it actually turns out that even preflop these effects, like the, that math holds about right. If you put in like twice the pot capture factor, it flushes and um, end up with you know three percent equity from drawing hands. You'll find that actually um, you do get about a post flop capture factor bonus of you know close to that amount, like five six percent from suited hands pre flop. So the math does line up. Um, you can start prove it empirically. It's in a weird little formula, but uh, but yeah, that's the idea here is that we've got enough turns where we're okay. We've got enough equity with our draws and flush draws where you can. So uh, maybe you can look at the chat. Tony asks uh, asked question and uh, I answered him uh, about the three of diamonds on the turn. Oh, on this board? Yeah, when... Oh, yeah. Oh, no. uh, we'd be able to check call, I think, most likely. Uh, um, he had, like, bot size bet left if he had bet uh, three quarters bot on the turn. If you turn they just a naked backdoor flush drawer. Yeah, so if there's a pot size bet left, we need about 33% equity. Um, and we'll have what, like uh, uh, four plus, oh no, um, 
3 plus 9, about 12 outs on the turn. So, so yeah, he, he meant when we check call the flop and then our opponent bets, he doesn't chop, but he bets like 3 quarters spot. On the turn? Yeah. Uh, so it'll be a kind of math, you know. You I, don't have a lot of implied odds, but it'll basically just be almost like pot odds. Like if he's betting 3 quarters pot, we need about... 30% capture factor, with a combo to draw a lot of little implied odds, we should be just about okay. So we'd be able to call. Um, that's a nice thing, we can call small bets with our combo draw. I guess we can't call a shove. We don't have enough equity in this case. Um, if we had a 7 of diamonds, we could call a shove. Um, I guess a, yeah, 7 of diamonds would let us call a shove. I guess a 6 of diamonds would similarly let us call a shove. We'd have just enough, probably. Okay. But, Even when you're so shallow, because yeah. I, I, I yeah. would assume that yeah. their mean raise ranges are quite tight. At uh... yeah, your minimizing ranges are stronger, and we don't have as much positional edge. I didn't realize we're eleven point seven. I thought we we're a little deeper. Yeah, that's fine. Um, unless he's min raising really wide or something, we still call. Yeah, nine three off is actually junk too. This is actually in our like bottom ten percent of our range, so this is okay to fold. GTO folds about ten percent of hands to a min raise. Um, yeah, I'd still limp here versus a weak player. It's going to be a little bit better. Limp, fold to shove, flat on all. Okay, from the speeding spins video pack, I, 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 from, from what I learned from there, it's, or maybe, yeah. it, it, I guess it's kind of obvious yeah. that you've just changed uh, your ways in some spots. But yeah. you did mention that it's better to shove a bit more, uh, being out of position. you bit better once you're very confident with your limping game and your post-flop and limp pots, you can squeeze out a little more edge limping there. Okay, um, okay. Population dies poorly enough, they don't ISO enough. Yeah, I thought that limping was uh, a lot worse considering we're out of position. No, okay. it, it would be worse if we were playing against like a strong reg. Um, but then actually oftentimes that hand min-raise call show. <laughs> as weird as it is, like it'll oftentimes be put into like a min-raise semi-flop range sort of thing. Um, or even not even a min raise, slightly bigger than a min raise. Um, but versus weak players, recreational limping is still a really good way to, you know, still leverage SPR and, and sort of play. Um, um, Alright, so here we limp full fine. You can also, yeah, I guess we're shallow and then don't really want min raise. Cool. Um, folding's good. Folding's good. Uh, Folding's good, well, he's hidden folding's good, yeah, that's good. Yeah, not hitting cards, that's all right, just gotta have some patience. Hey, there's a hand. Um, this is actually pretty damn close. Uh, like, this is one where it probably is nice to, like, have a reference and double check. These offsuit ace acts can be pretty unintuitive in a small blind. Uh, it looks like ace eight off is like a 13 big blind, get it in hand, so... I mean, I just assumed that Button is shoving all their ace six, or is that... Uh... They were 7.3, I just realized the blinds went up. Uh, if the blinds hadn't gone up, it'd be close, because we'd have like okay. 10 BBs, but yeah, 7.3, yeah, it's a clear call. Uh, but sh shouldn't uh, Button be shoving uh, a hand like ace twos here? Or if you were in Button's shoes, shoes what you, would you do with ace twos? Uh, that's a good question. Because the uh, B blind only has 11 B blinds or... You could consider limp folding um, to a shove. You could consider min raise, calling a shove from him, folding to him. Open shoving is probably okay too. We're a little bit on the deep side versus this player, just a little awkward like ace deuce off. But yeah, we're shoving a good amount of ace yeah. But ace deuce, you would rather just still limp fold it against the B blind? Yeah. yeah, against both big blind and small blind, we just fold to a shove. We win. Oh, okay. are going to be we never dom I mean, the thing with Ace Deuce is it never dominates anything. And it gets dominated a lot. So when your opponent shoves kind of like a pretty value heavy range, you just end up with really bad equity. Because their, their two high cards always have good equity and the rest of their range dominates you. Um, so there is a lot of room to still fold. I mean, you, don't, you, you could double check the pot odds math. Like, it's one of those spots where you can plug it into a calculator and double check 
But I mean, if the B blind was on 10 B blinds, you would just always shove there with the race twos, I assume. Yeah, if everyone has 8 BBs, yeah, we just shove. No, I mean, if B blind was 10 B blinds and small blind was shorter. 10 BBs, yeah, we'd probably shove it around that. Yep. That sounds reasonable. Alright, let's uh, do the why this game's over. I guess you had it filtered for three-handed or something. Whatever. Didn't see this hand. I, I didn't put in any filters. Maybe you can oh, check it. Oh, we didn't see this, did we? Oh, no, we did. No, this is from 15s that was... Uh, I had it open before our session, so maybe you can go back to the 30s and just open oh, here. it. Oh, this is uh, some... Oh, okay. Yeah, let's see what works. Uh, let's see what works. to uh, put it a little oh, bit smaller yeah. because yeah, the, the chat is blocking right. there on stream. Yep, yep. Sorry, guys. Is it good now? Yeah, clearly the fire buttons move this over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that got better. Um, I can't wait till coffee spins how it comes out. Can't believe how delayed it is. You, you, you haven't gotten a copy yet, have you? Yeah, I have it. I have it. <laughs> I, I didn't want to use it because uh, I, I, it, it, since it's, it's not out yet officially, so people can't really buy it themselves. So if they just ask me, like, what hard are yeah, you using, then... Coming out really soon. We just wanted to delay it a little to make sure everything was perfect. Um, that was why, I mean, it's why it's taken me so long to build this hunt in the first place. So, uh, we have no reads anyways. <laughs> oh, this work. Oh, well. Um, so I guess many yeah. people see that uh, hot the first time here on stream right now when you're opening it. There's a good chance. Um, I've, I've used it in a couple of videos in the past, uh, previous versions of it. Um, and so uh, there has been some, um, it, it, you know, I, I, it, some people might have seen some of it. I'm making a huge mess of this thing. Uh, I'm not putting this stuff in the right places. Um, it's a big enough hide where you kind of just have to have like um, a set like place for everything um, but you'll be able to check out the screenshots and stuff so yeah, did, did you choose uh, just the version that has even more stats or did you choose the lighter version right now <laughs> the smaller version this is the, the smaller version, version. <laughs> uh, I think we've got a even smaller one um, that we're going to be that we're, we're uh, this has been the thing that's been kind of keeping us is um, trying to maximize that, like, you know, how much stats can we remove versus space we can save versus still have it, you know, have labels and look nice. Um, the bigger one sort of actually fits, um, you know, similarly well, but just doesn't have as many labels. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I love this fight. Uh, yeah, it's a holy mess because I've just made a mess of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. And also, I think we have, um, I don't know if we are hero stats, but, um, but the idea of this hunt is that we've, it has so many stats because we've separated um, so many different uh, situations. Uh, yeah, you want to have space for hero stats. But hero stats are useless, to be honest. So um, they're really not worth having in most cases uh, because you oftentimes, I mean, you should know your own strategy. Like you should know what like your strategy you're using. So having the HUD stats isn't going to really help you much. Um, but anyways, uh, no, you actually don't have to toggle between three-way and heads up which is awesome. Um, what happens is this HUD turns into a heads-up HUD automatically. Um, essentially, a bunch of the panels just go black, blank, and you'll have some of the panels reused as heads-up ones. Um, it's a little bit more basic than Coffee HUD, but it'll still be um, you know, very quick. You know, on the plus side, if you don't need the de extra details, you don't need to switch anything, and you don't need to move anything. Everything's all in the same place. So this HUD you actually don't need to toggle in a sense because it has a heads up HUD already in it. Um, if you want to use some other heads up HUD, you'll have to toggle with some other method. Um, but yeah, so, so this HUD is it's, it's based for three-way, but it turns into a functional heads up HUD. 
Um, but yeah, it, I know it's, it's got a lot of panels. If we kind of organized it, it would look better. I just didn't, I forgot that, I didn't realize you would have it, so I didn't like think to have a screenshot how to set it up. Um, but uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't even pull it up. But, but I love this hub because it's, it's just, it has all clean stats. That's, that's like what I love about, like, that's what's really important to me is like, a, you know, poker theorist and stuff is, is having stats that are directly useful and that mean unambiguous things. Um, and part of that is separating out, we've separated out post-flop button versus big blind from like small blind versus big blind. We separate out three-way situations. Um, we sort of separated out all the post-flop stuff. So you can see how much they see bet three-way versus how much they see bet two-way. Because it's probably going to be a different number. Um, you know, similarly, we've got, you know, all the small blind versus big blind stuff separated correctly. We've got all the different stats grouped by uh, effective stacks, but also by non-all-in versus all-in. So um, I absolutely love this HUD. Once you get used to it, it's not as overwhelming. Um, in the end, there's not, you know, there's a lot of situations. That's why there's so many stats. But any, in any given situation, there's not that many things to look for, in a sense. Like, you just look over at the right panel, and you've got all the stuff. Um, the color coding is set up so you can easily distinguish between different stats, so you can easier sort of find stuff. So um, the official launch, launch date, we don't have an official launch date. Um, I mean, I would really hope it's by the end of the month. We've sort of been saying that for a while, though. I'm not really sure what's delaying it. I think, I, I think it's done, though. I'm pretty sure it's done. I just have to make a video and put it up. So um, there's a good chance maybe the next week. Uh, but it really should be done by the end of the month, March 1st, probably at latest. But don't quote me on that. It's sort of not up to me. But it, it should be really, really soon. Um, yeah. Um, well, no, so it, it, it doesn't, it's not like that. Um, it doesn't use too much space. Uh, it uses the same space. So it takes space from the three-handed HUD and turns it into heads-up space. Essentially what ends up happening is um, this panel turns into uh, pre-flop stats and our post-flop stats are turned into this button panel and I think this big black panel. So you'll end up with the same, you can use the same exact setup and have a, a somewhat limited copy spin, you know, copy HUD for, spin, uh, for heads up. Um, if you want even more detail, more, more post-flop, you have to switch to copy HUD. But, you know, for those first few hands or versus, you know, players that you read lists heads up anyways, it's perfect. You don't really need any more. You can focus on the other tables, switch to HUD. Um, that's sort of the idea. Uh, all right, so anyways, uh, yeah, now I've made the mess of the table. Um, we flatted pre, which was super clear. We just checked fold down. Yeah, this is too thick, then, probably. Uh, if you want to bet here, bet really small to get wider calls from ace high. Yeah, yeah, I was aiming ace high there, there, but yeah, bet sizing probably is. There are twos, but button opening ranges don't really have a lot of twos. So. In my mind, I was only going after ace high, but yeah, bet sizing. Just to make it worse, we also block ace high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anywhere <laughs> have some traps or something. It's pretty rare, though. Should be really cop too. So. It's okay. Just get a little smaller and keep this range wider. And then you can get good value from that. Standard. Yeah. And yeah, we can fold this. Um, we don't have backdoor flush draw equity, so we don't really want to defend um, a really crappy high curve. You can defend better high cards or uh, more playable high cards with backdoor equity. Uh, so we've been raised here. We're a little shallow. We might want to lend, but it's not a big deal. Um, the sand especially just is, again, playable enough where we might want to keep SPR a little deeper. And he min three bets. Well, and yeah, we flat and play cautious. So we just have to call any two cards when they click back, I assume? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. Uh, unless you're min raising like complete air, like seven views. Yeah, you're calling very close to any two cards. You get really, really good, um, good uh, sort of, you know, Pot odds and as I said, 17% is hard to say no to when you're in position. Um, you do have to be very careful though. You are up against over pairs a ton. Um, you know, you are sort of playing more just for applied odds. Just to hit a board and you know be able to continue. So it's fine still to play really good fold. Their ranges are pretty strong. But yeah, you can defend pretty wide because um, you do have implied so odds. So you got a question there about the launch date of the HUD? I thought I said that. Yeah, hopefully end of the month. Alright. Could be sooner, it could be a little later. Really soon, preferably. We'll see. Um, launch date was supposed to be like a month ago. 
<laughs> the original hope, but uh, we just wanted to take care of it a little more to make it even better. Uh, so so as I assume here you would, but did I, what did I do? I just open fold it? Would you? I don't remember. I, I think I had I had I had reads on this guy being really aggressive brief up, but I don't know if you can you see any of his stats here or not. Yeah, here's his big blind. I think this is him. Yeah, put it in the wrong section. No, looks like I didn't have anything on him. Okay. Yeah, he folded to some big size of yours. Yeah, I was I was a bit too scared just limping. Uh, Brief flop. I, I I thought that limping out of position blinding as blind was quite. You had to do it with a much stronger range, so I kind of yeah. overestimated. Yeah, they fold, they fold ISO and they overfold post. In theory, yeah, you have to be careful with it, but in practice, people don't ISO enough and they massively overfold the limp C bets. So it still ends up pretty good. This is fine. There's some room to trap here, especially if you had some reads to use aggro, although I don't actually think we have those reads. Um, you could uh, min raise or limp here. Both are really good. I'd say probably limp, again, to keep um, SPR deeper for our flag, not high flush draw. So I'd probably limp call shove, but uh, min raise is also good there. Oh, but shoving's okay, but we're a little deep and we're a little bit too playable with ace eight suited. Um, especially if we have ranks at the table or you know higher one or we might maximize one. Standard. Um, again, you can actually still limp here. Limp both the shoves. It's a nice hand of semi flop. Um, like, open shoving is fine, but the thing is that the population kind of calls too light with ace axe, king axe hands. So you sort of do worse open shoving than you should, because it's sort of a semi flop. But, but how deep um, would you uh, still limp it? Like, 9B plus deep, what would you do then? Yeah, around 9 BBs, I'd still limp it. Maybe around eight, start open shoving. Something like that sounds reasonable. But I mean, uh, how wide would you limp there on the button if you are on like 10 B plans? Like, hands our like... Our VPIP should be really low, so it'll be limping sort of... I, I basically just limp by semi-bluffs and some very strong trapping hands. So big pocket pairs, a lot of pocket pairs, and some suited ace -axe. Maybe some suited kings. What about eight, nine off? Um... That we just would be open folding. Probably be open folding that a little bit even shallower. But that would be the type of hand. We'll be limping like 10 9 off. Maybe 10 8 off if we're still playing it. Um, jack 10 off. We'll be limping a lot of seated connectors. Alright. Uh, fine. Uh, oh yeah, you should be playing. You can play this. You can actually main raise this versus uh, recreational players. They just overfold so much. It's a really good type of bluffing pen. Um, so far, we don't have reads. So you prefer mean raising over limping, right? Yeah, slightly. I think mean raising these um, low card bluffs tends to be a little bit better. But again, it's close. We are suited, so there's rooms like limp and keep SPR deeper. But with the amount that people overfold, it's really good to be min raising some low cards in those places. Fine, fine. Fine. That's like a wider shove. That's like, and we're not limping. It's like 8.4. We wouldn't even really think about it. If we were to heads up, sit and go, we could sometimes limp there. But here we go. All right, cool. Um, when one of the opposing stacks is short, min raising becomes worse. Mm, no, not really. What do you mean by that? You mean from the button or from the small blind? Um, it's actually, it, bluffing ends up being actually, versus the population, bluffing at sort of every stack is very similar. Um, as you get shallower, people fold more, actually, but they three bet a little more. And the two kind of end up about balancing out. So bluffing ends up being very similarly profitable because they overfold so much. And they fold even more and more as they get shallower. They three bet a little more, which makes other stuff, but uh, yeah. Oh, from the button, yes. Yeah, he probably means that you're committing yourself to call a shot when the... Uh, That's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, when there's a short stack, uh, limping becomes a much, much better option. When one, when there's one short stack and stacks are asymmetric. Um, yeah, yeah, from the button. That's absolutely correct, true. Yep. 
And yeah, there will be a video of this for sure. Um, it'll be co-posted on hsng.com, probably on T plus two as well. Uh, I think that's what we did with the other one too. So um, definitely look for it um, for the video from this. But yeah, I think we probably should uh, look to wrap it up, uh, especially if you were still going to grind tonight. No, I don't um, care. I, <laughs> I mean, not that I, not that I don't care, but. From anyone, but if, uh, if, 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 if gonna call it a day. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind if you would just go on forever and ever, but I think you still have places to go or things to do that... <laughs> yeah. yeah, we all do, don't we? There's always places to go and things to do. Yep, it's but Friday night. Miles of life. <laughs> Alright. Cool. Okay, cheers! Alright. I, I stole your, I stole your uh, catchphrase or the ending of your stream. I learned that when I was in the UK. I love the cheers. I mean, I listened to your video pack and then you quite often just ended it with cheers. So yeah, I, I'm pretty classic sign off. So just the moment I realized uh, that we're going to do this uh, coaching coaching session, I, the one thing I wanted to do was um, say cheers before you at the end of the stream. Well, you did it. You did it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I don't know what my other ones are. Hey, guys. <laughs> That's a pretty common company. <laughs> Hey guys, yeah, for some reason I actually start my stream always with hey guys, so I don't know, maybe I've actually stolen it from you. Well, it's very good. It's a very <laughs> effective, quick way to start. Um, and yeah, I guess it's slightly sexist, but you know, <laughs> population tendencies. It's maximally exploitative of population tendencies. <laughs> <laughs> so, alright, yeah, that's uh, 10 words. Yep, yeah, cheers everyone. Hope you uh, run good. Win some, win some big spins and stuff. And, uh, yeah, check you guys out next time. I'll definitely try to set something like this up again, um, probably with both Paul and you. It's definitely a lot of fun, so it was fun interacting with all you guys. Uh, thanks for all the good questions. Um, yeah, there's, like, no trolling. I, people always, always say these, like, horrible things about Twitch. You know? Like, everyone's these, like, crazy people, and it's hard to keep them occupied. You guys have been great. I don't know what everyone talks about. I was the um, only one trolling here. Yeah, you were the only one trolling. You're the one who banned some random guy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's uh, good stuff. Oh, there we go. Now, now we get some. Yeah, we got, well, Paul. Everyone knows Paul's a troll. What a DJ. All right. See you guys. All Bye -bye. right. Thank you. Did you click it? Did he? Okay, then you know. Okay. So I'm gonna restart the stream and I'm gonna play a session as well. Come back with a 90 second delay. So yeah, if you wanna stick around, I will be playing uh, $15 spinning goes. Well, meanwhile, I might just, I will just show you the graph that ended my shot at 30s. That's like a total Mount Everest there. I, I just need to show it to you. Let's see. So I'm back to playing 15s because of that downswing. Just wait for a few more moments, it's gonna show the graph, it's quite something. But yeah, on, on a 90 buying downswing there in 30s, but I still have a cheap BB of 72. So I got that going for me, which is nice I guess, but it would be... Uh, <laughs> Even nicer to actually uh, earn some money. Really sucks to go down in stakes when you're just beating a higher level at such a such a high win rate, but it just happens. I did choose a really aggressive background management as well, so so there was quite a big chance of actually me having to go back to 15s. But I will still uh, get to take a new shot at 30 soon. Unless I hit a, like a, just an 
insane bad luck and run really horrible in 15s as well. If spins are not gonna work out for you, will you go back to heads up terrible poor man's no there's no way spins are not working out for me. It's now I have a somewhat of a decent sample size. Uh, between 15s and 30s I have 2,000 games now and I have 1.1 thousand games in 30s so even though the sample size is not that big uh, then my GPV is still high enough to expect me to be able to still uh, beat stakes comfortably in long term as well uh, restart the stream meanwhile okay that's a good idea let's do it so yeah, we'll be back with a 90 second delay.